Good morning. Welcome to the 2019 deliberative session for the town of Hampton. Thank you for coming. We're going to get started. The warrant has been posted in accordance with law. I'd like to have, if I could, our former town clerk lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. We welcome Jane Seifer back. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jane. At this time, I'd like to introduce the officials here on the stage. To my far right, Regina Barnes, uh, Vice Chair of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, next to Regina is Rick Griffin, and then our Chair, Rusty Bridle, uh, Jim Waddell is uh, the other, uh, the last member of the Board of Selectmen before we get to Town Manager Fred Welch and our Town Attorney Mark Gerald. Over in the far right, my far right, uh, is Christy Pulliam, who's our Finance Director, who will be assisting us. And I miss Mary Louise Woolsey, who has joined us on the stage. She is also a member of the Board of Selectmen. And, um, some place, but I know he's been working to get everything ready for us uh, with regard to our planning and zoning articles, Jason Bashan, uh, our administrative assistant, the assistant to the town manager, Christina Osman, who will be helping with the items that we will post up on the screen. Uh, also, I have our town clerk, Shirley Doheny, um, with, with me, and Shirley will need um, all of the um, names and addresses of the participants um, in today's um, meeting. Out in the hallway, Arlene Andriozzi, Janine St. Germain. I haven't seen Nancy Stiles, but I know um, that uh, Janine and Arlene are there to check you in. You need to have checked in. You need to be a registered voter in order to participate in today's um, meeting. And you will get a voter card, which will allow you to, to vote on the uh, articles that we'll discuss today. Um, also assisting the town clerk is Cheryl Hildreth. Assisting the moderator, assisting me today, my name is Bob Casaza, serving as moderator today. Assisting me today, Representative Pat Bushway, Nathan Page, and Daryl Mosher. Uh, there's coffee and food uh, out in the hall, uh, including lunch. Lunch will be served. There will be a raffle, all in support of our eighth grade students from Hampton Academy who this year will be going to Washington, D.C. So a little bit further, uh, so a little bit more support if you can provide it to them uh, by either buying food or participating in their raffle and the raffle will be drawn, the winners will be drawn shortly after the lunch hour. Today we are here to discuss, debate and possibly amend 50 Warren articles. Uh, the warrant having been prepared by the selectmen and also augmented by petition warrant articles submitted by citizens with a requisite number of signatures. Some of those warrant articles cannot be amended. For example, the zoning and planning articles, those are articles two through nine, are not subject to amendment by law, as well as the collective bargaining agreements that are set forth at articles 12 and 13. All of these articles will appear on the ballot. We'll reconvene on March 12th at the dining hall here at Winnicunnet between the hours of 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. where you'll have the opportunity to cast your votes on all 50 of the articles. So today's work is to determine what those articles will say, the form of those articles, how they will appear on that ballot on March 12th, and that is in your hands today. Our ability to amend those articles is restricted. We can't eliminate a warrant article. No new purposes can be introduced. They all, all the purposes have to be warned. People have to have known uh, and, and, and in theory made an informed choice of whether to show up here today or not, so nothing new can be introduced. The purpose of an appropriation cannot be changed and no warrant article shall be uh, amended to eliminate the subject matter although amendments may change the intent of an article. 
We're going to proceed one article at, the of, at a time. I will read the article after the article has been moved and seconded for discussion. I'll recognize the proponent of the article first and then open the article for discussion by the assembly. I will recognize a new speaker on an article before returning to someone who has already spoken on the article with the exception that the proponent of the article will be permitted to answer questions or offer further details regarding the purpose of the article in response to a question or as appropriate. Please direct all questions to me. If you wish to speak, please wait to be recognized and then speak into the microphone at the podium so that we can carry your comments over channel 22 to those folks who are at home today and for those who may view the meeting uh, later um, and as it's repeated um, before March 12th. Please begin your remarks by stating your name and address. We'll only deal with one amendment at a time. There are sheets of paper here on the corner of the stage, so you'll need to reduce your amendment to writing, uh, and that amendment will be given to the town clerk and to Christina Osman so that we can get the amendment up on the screen so that all can, can see. Amendments have to be moved and seconded, and if you're speaking on an amendment, please focus on the content of the amendment. If you're speaking on an article, please focus on the content of the article and refrain from personal comments. I will revoke recognition of any speaker who speaks or acts in, a, in an abusive or disruptive manner, and I will revoke recognition of any speaker who refuses to keep his or her comments relevant to the article or the amendment or who is needlessly repetitive. Non-residents will be allowed to speak on your affirmative vote. If an issue arises during the meeting that's not covered by these rules, I intend to use fairness and majority rule as guiding principles with due considerations for the minority's right to be heard. This is your meeting and my determinations may be overruled by you. Voting will be conducted by a hand vote or a standing vote as appropriate. We also have voting machines in the hall to the extent a secret ballot is uh, requested. Five voters may make a request in writing prior to a vote that the vote be taken by secret written ballot. After the vote has been declared, but before any other business has begun, any non-ballot vote may be questioned by seven voters and the vote shall be retaken by secret yes, no ballot. Reconsideration of votes previously taken may be restricted at any time during the meeting by an affirmative uh, vote uh, by your affirmative vote, so that's the practice of restricting reconsideration. Uh, per the state fire code, please note the location of the exits, and if the fire alarm activates, please leave the building by the nearest exit and assemble in front of the SAU building. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to allow non-resident staff of the town of Hampton to speak during the meeting to answer questions and to provide information regarding any warrant article, specifically the following non-residents. Town Manager Fred Welch, Town Attorney Mark Gerald, Building Inspector Kevin Schultz, Finance Director Christy Pulliam, Recreations and Parks Director Renee Boudreau, our Fire Chief Jamie Ayotte, Administrative Assistant Christina Osman, our Public Works Director Chris Jacobs, our Lane Library Director Amanda Cooper, and the President of Local 2664, Hampton Firefighters Jed Carpentier. I have a motion to so move moved by um, Ms. Woolsey, seconded by Mr. Bridal. All those in favor of allowing those non-residents to assist us today, raise your voter cards. Thank you. Down cards. Any opposed? Those individuals whose names I just read off will be allowed to speak uh, during the meeting. Now we turn to Article 1, which is informational. It's the list of candidates for, uh, who've submitted their names for election in our March 12th election at Winnicunit. Um, and I will read their names. Uh, their order is determined by a formula that the Secretary of State um, provides. So for the Board of Selectmen, one opening, one candidate, Regina Barnes. For Town Clerk, one opening, three candidates, Shirley Doheny, Patricia Laflamme, Michelle O'Brien Hansen. Trustee of the Trust Funds, there's one opening, no one has submitted um, any, any uh, uh, written interest in the position, so that's an open position at the moment. A library trustee, one opening, one candidate, Chris Hendry. Cemetery trustee, one opening, two candidates, Susan Irwin, Uta Pinio.
Planning Board, there are two openings and there are five candidates, Keith Lassard, Francis McMahon, Chris McFerrin, and Taki Bielabreski and Elena Deegan. Budget Committee, two openings, two candidates, uh, Stephen Henderson and Joyce Scabardis. Zoning Board, one opening, one candidate, Brian Provo, Provincial. So we're moving on to Article 2, and that begins our consideration of the zoning and planning uh, articles. These articles are not subject to uh, amendment, but they often inform what our town looks like. So I've asked the town planner, Jason Bashan, to uh, aid us, assist us in a discussion. And as we've done in recent years, I would entertain a motion to consider articles two through nine as a group. Those are the zoning and planning articles. I'll so move. Moved by Ms. Woolsey, seconded by Mr. Bridal. All those in favor of dealing with these articles as a group, raise your voter cards. Thank you. Down cards. Any opposed? Seeing none, we'll consider them as a group. And in that vein, I would also entertain a motion to waive the reading of articles two through nine in their entirety due to their length. Moved by Mr. Bridal is their second. Seconded by uh, Ms. Barnes. All those in favor of waiving the reading of articles two through nine, voter cards up, down cards, any opposed? And finally, I would uh, entertain a motion to open discussion on articles two through nine. Moved by Ms. Woolsey. Do I have a second? Seconded by Mr. Bridal. All those in favor of moving to discuss articles two through nine, thank you. Any opposed? Um, I'll now recognize our town planner, Jason Bashan, who will take us through articles two through nine, and there'll be um, slides to assist us, and we'll break after each article so that if you have a question, uh, or comment on any article, we'll, we'll take them in that fashion. Um, Jason, please start okay. us off on Article 2. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I just did want to briefly mention that the full text of each of the amendments is out in the uh, hallway and also on the town's website if people want to view that at any point in time. Um, starting with Article 2, I'm, I'm going to do a purpose statement and overview of each of these on Article 2. The purpose is to provide for the review of demolition activities that meet specified thresholds prior to issuance of a demolition permit. As an overview, this article includes a new definition of demolition under section 1.6. A new section 1.8 titled demolition review is proposed to encourage the preservation of buildings and places of art, historic, architectural, and community value. A staff level review of demolition permit applications that meet specified thresholds is also included with said reviews typically completed in no more than 30 days. While this article is not intended to prohibit demolition, it will provide an opportunity to hit the pause button so the town staff may work with developers and property owners to consider practical preservation efforts. Okay, anyone wishing to be heard? Anyone have any questions on article two, which deals with regulations relative to demolition of buildings in our town. Seeing none, Article 3, Jason. Okay. Uh, the purpose of Article 3 is to require new construction and substantial improvements to structures in the Title 50-foot wetland buffer to be elevated on pylons. As an overview, uh, this article requires that all new construction and substantial improvement projects within the Title Wetland Conservation District comply with the FEMA guidelines previously adopted by the town for Zone BE Special Flood Hazard Area, Coastal High Hazard Areas. As noted in the purpose statement, this would result in the need for those structures to be elevated on pilings. It is also noted that the construction work shall have no adverse impact on adjacent properties. Jason, could you give us a sense of where in town the title wetland conservation district is. What what properties or what generally what part of town are we are, is Article Three going to impact? We're talking about coastal areas primarily. Um, I would invite actually JD or Ray in at any point in time that they wanted to jump in since the conservation commission did uh, were proponents of this article initially. Yeah. Um, but those areas and we did identify how many properties would be affected. It wasn't a substantial number as I recall. I don't have the number yeah. with me though. Is it? If you know, is it just properties that border the marsh, or is it properties that are oceanfront as well? It could be both. Could be both. Okay. Anyone wishing to be heard on Article Three? Seeing none. 
Jason, if you could introduce Article 4. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I would like to be heard, please. I'm sorry. I didn't and, see you. And my remarks are going to apply to Article 3 and Article 4. We have a problem in this community, and these two articles are amending the Wetland Conservation District. The wetlands have expanded, as all of you know, and we've got to stop any building in this town in wetlands. The Board of Selectmen, on the 29th of January, received an email from a very nice lady who lives on uh, Island Path, and what she said is the following. I'm looking for help with grant money offered through the government to raise our home out of the floods. We live at Island Path and have flooded seven times in 2018 and one additional time this year, 2019. We've been told by the state hazard mitigation officer that we would have to get our town of Hampton to petition for us for grant money. In other words, a community letter of intent for the elevation of our home. I will say to you that I have tremendous respect for the Conservation Commission in Hampton, but we are deluding ourselves as to the town wetlands. People should not be building new structures in the wetlands, and it says clearly, you can read it on your article, we're talking about wetlands, wetlands are wet, and there should be no expansion allowed, and there should be no raising up on pilings allowed, because all that's going to do is trap people in their homes while they watch their cars float about in the yard on the water. I am opposed to three and four. We need to wake up as a community and stop, stop any encroachment, any building, any enhancements anywhere in our wetlands. Thank you, Ms. Woolsey. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 3? Oh, over here. Mr. I Griffin. would like to point out that if anyone didn't get the drift of that letter, the lady is trying to get her house put onto stilts. And um, she finds it's probably her only answer from what, how the letter reads. Um, and it, this really doesn't have anything to do with her trying to get the town to do anything, but there are FEMA guidelines and there are areas where people are looking to protect their homes. So regardless of what that lady said, she's, um, her letters, I'm not addressing what she was writing in her letter, but she is trying to do what this is calling for. Thank you. Ms. Wolsey. Just a, a quick rebuttal. We understand what is happening in this community, and we have got to stop allowing building. We've got to stop spending money, whether it's grant money or town money, with the problems that are occurring. Seven times that poor lady's property was flooded. You want to pay to live in a community where you're going to be flooded seven times a year, we have got to stop the building, the amending, the fooling around, and stop any encroachment into the wetlands. Thank you, Ms. Wolsey. Seeing no one else on Article 3, Jason, yes. Article 4, please. Okay. The purpose of Article 4 is to make the calculation of minimum lot area and minimum lot area per dwelling unit consistent in all zoning districts as it relates to the Wetland Conservation District. As an overview, this article modifies Section 2.3.7c of the Wetland Conservation District Ordinance and provides cross-referencing within the definition of lot area in Section 1.6 and also through a footnote in Section 4.1, which is the section on minimum lot area, and 4.1.1, the section on minimum lot area per dwelling unit. The special provision section, specifically section C, C1, and C2, are amended so that the required minimum lot area and the minimum lot area per dwelling unit only apply to newly created lots and lots incre increasing the number of existing dwelling units. The corresponding calculation is based on 100% of the lot area 
that is located outside of the Wetland Conservation District. Thank you, Jason. Anyone <coughs> wishing to be heard on Article 4? Seeing none, we'll move on to Article 5. Okay. The purpose of Article 5 is to provide flexibility to property owners that want to elevate their structures to make them more flood resilient. As an overview, this article amends the existing free board requirement in Section 2.4.9 to allow property owners to increase the maximum height requirement provided in Article 4, Section 4.4, an additional one or two feet above the required one foot of free board. If the elevation of the structure's lowest floor above the base flood elevation results in the exceedance of the maximum height requirement, then the maximum height requirement shall be increased by the elevation amount that exceeds it, up to three feet. For example, if a property owner in the RA zoning district is at the height maximum and elects to elevate their structure three feet above the base flood elevation, the maximum permitted height of the structure would be increased to 38 feet, which is three feet above the maximum that is usually 35. For that district. Anyone wishing to be heard on Article 5? <coughs> Anyone having any questions about Article 5? Increasing the height for those properties that are in that zone. Ms. Wolsey. Ms. Wolsey. Once again, Mr. Moderator, we are pulling the wool over property owners' eyes. If they think it's going to help them by raising their building three feet on stilts or whatever you call it, they're not going to be able to get in and out. They're not going to be able to park their car in their yard. They'll have to go to the town parking lot, which also may be flooded. We can't address the current problems with global warming and increased flooding by articles like this. And once again, I am totally opposed. Thank you, Ms. Wolsey. Anyone else? Mr. Griffin. Yeah, but once again, there are many homes down at the beach in this area that have had uh, been there for a hundred years and they're probably not going anywhere um, and there are some of the people that do have problems down there that were held over the last 40 years in some areas to 35 feet when today they could build there at 50 feet um, and today with this thing with this past it would be even a little bit more but the problems that exist for these people with these homes it's because it was restricted to uh, um, 35 feet at one time. And the play people weren't allowed to build their houses big enough to be out of the uh, areas that are affected today. So a lot has changed over the years. And um, everybody that is doing anything to their existing homes are looking to make them better. And, uh, and it really shows down there. And sometimes they're being rehabbed completely. But these little bit of uh, elevation. In some cases, the land has even sunk down there. If you've lived there for the last 40 years, you could tell the land is actually lower, just like what happens to the town roads. They lower into the ground and have to be made bigger. And that's happened to a lot of people that live down at the beach. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 5? <coughs> yes, Ms. Wilsard. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, good morning. Keith Lassard, 173 Mill Road. I'm hearing a lot of conversation about we're building on wetlands and we're encouraging building in wetlands and all these homes are built on uplands that flood. They're not wetlands. The reason we propose to increase the height is because we do recognize that the ocean levels have changed over the last thousands of years, and we're recognizing it maybe a little bit more rapidly now. But these homes are built. We're allowing them to have more flow through underneath their property, so the impact to their own personal property is allowed. This is, it's legal to build where they build. This is allowing them to have more water if there is flooding to go underneath the house and out causing less damage. It's actually encouraging them to build up. Not to build like South Carolina, Georgia, and the Louisiana Bayou where you know you're up 14 feet. Just enough so the water flows in and out. Um, it's also very important that this is implemented as part of our flood plain 
um, insurance um, compliance. The more regulations we have that allow people to protect their property from Mother Nature or God or whoever we want to call the cause, um, will reduce their rates. The, the flood insurance is um, recognized and will reduce it for everybody that has flood insurance if we have these regulations on our records. Again, um, the planning board is not allowing people to build in wetlands. Conservation does not allow people to be built in wetlands. Our rules and regulations do not allow people to be built in wetlands. I guess the only exception would be if a pier has to be rebuilt or a bridge. But they have to go through wet, wet water permitting processes. It's a very stringent process. As, as Mrs. Wolseley pointed out in that letter, the woman that would like to improve her own property because of her love of living at the ocean, her love of looking at the marsh, um, is to protect her investments. I love the beach. I'd love to live down there. Um, I think everybody loves to live down there. A lot of people aspire to be at the coast. Um, and people will continue. So what's put regulations in that make it safer and make their insurance costs a little bit less? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lissard. Mr. Griffin. I just wanted to say one more time, although Keith said it right at the very end, all of these articles are, uh, or many of them, are going to be beneficial in lowering the price of flood insurance for everybody, not just people at the beach, but people that live on the other side of 95 that have flood insurance. And there's a lot of people today from all the different flood insurance things that I go to that uh, even if you live near a, a manhole, you should have flood insurance. So these type of regulations are going to lower flood insurance prices for everybody eventually. All right, Ms. Wolsey. Yes, I, I hate to belabor the point, but I think I'll do it anyway. Does anyone have an idea, Mr. Bouchon, perhaps, what it costs a homeowner to have their house in the wetlands raised up and have the pilings, et cetera, put underneath it. What, what would it cost an individual roughly to do that work? We're talking about spending, I imagine, a significant amount of money. I don't know the exact dollar figure, to be honest with you about that. I don't know if anybody else. So he doesn't have a figure. I don't have a figure. I, I we, can, could, we could look at that, but. I, don't I can have appreciate figure. that. But if we are suckering people in, making them think that they can keep the good old homestead even when the floodwaters come in. I think it's, it's deceiving the public, and I think it's a very, very bad, uh, bad idea. Ms. Wolsey. Yes, ma'am. Morning, everyone. I'm Alina Degon. I live on 1 Backhawk Avenue in your tidal wave wetlands, and I'm also running for the planning board open position. So. I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, to answer your question, I have uh, a lot of our neighbors have gone through this process, and it's anywhere from twenty to forty thousand dollars, depending on the size of the home, how much they want to go up. It is an ex um, a kind of a good high cost, but you think about once you're up in a certain elevation. My house is a seven feet above the um, wetlands, so my insurance is down. I was paying twenty five hundred dollars a year for flood insurance, now I'm paying 600. So the price over the time does um, outweigh it when you don't have to pay that flood insurance. So just wanted to answer your question, ma'am. And uh, But thank you guys for everyone for being here. So, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 5? Seeing none, Jason, <coughs> Article 6, please. Article 6, uh, the purpose of Article 6 is to remove an existing and effective requirement from the conditional uses section of the Aquifer Protection District Ordinance. As an overview, this article would remove a 2016 revision to the conditional uses section that added language requiring a written statement to be prepared by a qualified professional engineer verifying that the property remains in compliance with the conditional use permit and all applicable requirements of the Aquifer Protection District Ordinance. The written statement is to be filed every two years or upon or before any transfer of title. Applicants are already required to submit written findings of fact, verifying that all seven protective measures listed in the ordinance prior to the planning board granting a conditional use permit in this district. Since the requirement only applies to new projects that trip a conditional use permit, 
the scope is very limited and it cannot be applied equitably throughout the aquifer protection district. Any comment, questions on Article 6? Seeing none, on to Article 7. <clears throat> Article 7. The purpose of Article 7 is to specify the zoning districts where the recording of a declaration of covenants, conditions, and restrictions is required as part of an accessory dwelling unit approval, or ADU approval. As an overview, this article amends the ADU ordinance to specify that only those ADUs located in the RA or RAA zoning districts will require a recorded declaration. Note that other zoning districts that allow ADUs also allow two-family dwellings by right. ADU declarations state that the property must revert to single-family use with only one dwelling unit if the current or future owner no longer occupies either the principal dwelling unit or the accessory dwelling unit as his or her principal place of residence. Since the intent of the declaration is to protect single-family neighborhoods, it is unnecessary to require the extra legal measure of recording a declaration in zoning districts where someone could simply establish a two-family dwell two dwelling by right. Thank you. Anyone wishing to be heard on Article 7? I gather this is sort of a housekeeping it article is. as That's we correct. get more familiar with the ADU ordinance, which was, uh, which was introduced, approved uh, several years ago. Yep. Seeing no comment on Article 7, Article 8, please. Okay, Article 8. The purpose is to provide requirements for feather, sail, or teardrop signs and to specify that air dancers are not permitted. And just to clarify what those are, feather, sail, teardrop signs are basically freestanding, not attached to a building, but are attached to a pole and the flag-like part of them looks kind of like a feather, sail, or teardrop. And an air dancer is a movie, moving, wavy, fan-driven, or inflatable device that's often tubular and depicts a character, just so people know what, what we're referring to here. As an overview, this article amends the, the sign regulations to cover those two types that are not uh, specifically addressed at this time. New definitions of feather, sail, or teardrop sign and air dancer are provided in Section 5.2. Air dancers are added to section 5.4.1, which identifies those signs as expressly prohibited in all zones. Specific requirements are established for feather sail teardrop signs under new section 5.4.2J, such as location, quantity, how they're measured, and so forth. Uh, feather sail teardrop signs are added to table one, stating that they may be permitted in the B, BS, BS1, I, and G zones. Air dancers are again noted in Table 1 as prohibited in all zones. Further, Table 2 is amended to state that 32 square feet is the maximum size for the feather sail or teardrop type signs. Anyone wishing to be heard? Any questions on Article 8 relative to sign regulation? Seeing none, on to Article 9. Okay, the purpose of Article 9 is to expand the existing requirement of how stacked parking is addressed in relation to the number of required parking spaces. As an overview, this article amends the existing stacked parking regulation. Currently, section 6.3.10 states that stacked parking shall constitute one required parking space regardless of the number of parking spaces in the stack, but it only applies to condominium conversions of pre-existing non-conforming uses. The proposed article adds a new section 6.3.11, which applies that language to any lot containing one or more residential dwelling units. But it should be noted that properties predating this amendment will be unaffected unless there's a major, major change in the site, such as an application for a condominium conversion or an addition of an accessory dwelling unit as examples. Anyone have any comment, question on Article 9, which determines how we count parking spaces and stack. stack. If you have yeah. one behind the other, we'll only count as one space. Even That's if correct. there are three in a row, it'll be one, one space uh, for, for complying with parking requirements. Anyone, any commentary on Article 9? Seeing none, we are on to Article 10. I'm gonna ask Jason Bashan to stay with us since this is a planning zoning article and I'll read article 10 shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $18,000 for the purpose of contracting professional planning services for the completion of a series of phase one tasks intended to provide the foundation for a future update of the town of Hampton master plan for RSA 674 
colon one, it is the duty of the planning board to prepare and amend from time to time a master plan to guide the development of the municipality. Further, RSA 674 colon three Roman two states that states that revisions to the plan are recommended every five to 10 years. Most chapters of the existing town of Hampton master plan are considerably older than 10 years and the plan as a whole is not in a user friendly format. This article is for phase one only and the proposed tasks to be completed during the initial phase of work include establishing and facilitating a master plan, steering committee, committee facilitating intermunicipal coordination, initiating a visioning process resulting in a draft vision chapter and preparing with steering committee guidance, a master plan template outlining anticipated chapters and general content areas. It is also anticipated that technology will be utilized to engage with the residents of Hampton. The deliverables from phase one will provide the town of Hampton planning board with options for pursuing phase two of the project, which would include the full update of the town's master plan. This shall be a non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 32 colon seven Roman six and shall not lapse until the purpose of this article is completed or by December 31, 2021, whichever is sooner. A majority vote is required to pass article 10. It is recommended by the planning board seven zero, recommended by the board of Selectman 5-0, but it is not recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee on a vote of 2-6-0. The fiscal impact note from the Finance Department, the estimated 2019 tax impact on $18,000 is five-tenths of one cent per thousand dollars of valuation. I'll take a motion to open discussion on Article 10, moved by Ms. Wolsey. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Griffin. Is there anyone? Jason, you, would you like to speak uh, to Article 10? Uh, yes, I just have had a brief uh, slideshow for, okay. for everybody on that. So um, this is for phase one of the very important project of updating the town of Hampton's master plan. I'll, I'll begin with some facts about uh, master plans in New Hampshire and, and our master plan in Hampton. Um, this is something that's, that's required by law. It's in RSA 674 colon one through 674 colon four about um, updating and, and preparing and amending a master plan from time to time to guide the development of the municipality. Um, the RSA also um, recommends revisions every five to 10 years of the master plan. Uh, the current master plan was adopted in 1985. There have been some subsequent chapter amendments since that time, which has really made it evolve into a very um, unusable large document with sections that haven't been updated correspondingly. Um, the 85 master plan replaced the 1969 master plan. That's a 16 year difference there. But it's been 34 years since the master plan's been updated, since the last comprehensive update anyway. And having a current master plan will allow the town to be more competitive for grant funding for it's pursuing. So you can see on the screen up there the um, existing master plan. It's a very uh, cumbersome binder of um, over time that's been amended. It's very hard to use. You can't really use it. It's unmanageable, um, in addition to being outdated as noted. Um, the proposed master plan, um, and with the planning board's discussions that have been going on over the course of many months, and actually longer than that, um, they will be looking for a clear and concise document of far less length than the current plan. And once completed, the current master plan, once both phases, phases of the project are completed, it must be a living document, not collecting dust on a shelf. And we will ensure this by either establishing an implementation committee or the planning board to take responsibility for that. It's also, as I'll note later, this is gonna be a public process. The public is gonna be invited to be a part of this um, process to help craft this plan. So you'll all be sure to make sure that we're doing as, as we say we're going to do with it. Um, next slide. Um, the elements of a master plan. Um, under the RSAs, um, a vision section and a land use section, which would be existing in future land use, are required under the RSAs. Um, but other sections are to be, are, may be included as well. Um, you can see a list of those on your screen. The current plan has a number of those, and, and most, if not all, community master plans touch on a number of these. Um, the current sections that, up there that we don't have right now economic development, regional concern, community design, energy, and coastal management. And you look at a couple of those, like coastal management and economic development, that's very surprising. I mean, in a coastal community that you wouldn't have a coastal management uh, section of your master plan. Um, a couple of the sections are handled separately. The natural hazard section, for example, is the town's hazard mitigation plan that was recently adopted in 2016. That's just simply would be incorporated by reference. 
Um, the neighborhood plan is the uh, Hampton Beach Area Master Plan, um, which the Hampton Beach Area Commission works on updates. Um, there was a recent transportation update to that. So those two plan um, elements would be incorporated by reference into this new plan, not part of the, the ongoing work that we would be doing. Next, thank you. Um, as far as the proposed project, uh, the planning board, as I noted, has been discussing possible methods for effectively addressing the town's outdated master plan for some time, uh, probably a couple of years actually. It's been on my radar since I got here over four years ago. Um, the Rockingham Planning Commission did do a review of the plan in 2018, and we had subsequent meeting with them, some planning board members and the planning office back in October to discuss their findings and decide upon a strategy for updating it. And it was decided that a two-phase pro, two approach to updating was the most effective uh, strategy. And I'll break that down in the following slides. We're talking about phase one under this article. So there's a table on the screen uh, for phase one, um, which is setting the foundation for the overall update. Um, the tasks there are steering committee facilitation, intermunicipal coordination, vision session and chapter, outreach, and a master plan template. There's also a description of those tasks, the costs associated, and the time frame that, that we're looking at. I did highlight some specific language under the description because I wanted to highlight, you know, mention those areas specifically because those describe really what you're getting out of this phase one, the deliverable products and, and the, the reason it's so important to do this. Let me go on to the next. Okay, so technical and guidance information really is more than simply collecting data. It, it's a team effort. It requires multidisciplinary experience to cover the range of elements, as I noted, that are in a master plan. Um, working documents would be generated from the steering committee discussions uh, that are held as a result of this. But this is something that not only the planning office, but the planning board can't do this alone. I mean, so we need to be we're working closely with our chosen planning services provider to do this to make sure that we're covering everything effectively. And it's just a monumental task. There's just a lot of work involved with, with doing this. Um, preparing a draft vision chapter. As I noted, it's one of the required elements under the RSA of a master plan. It's really the most, one of the most critical elements. Um, it involves a set of statements articulating the desires of the residents. As I noted, this is a public process. Everyone's invited to the table for this. And the guiding principles and priorities to implement the vision would come of that. Uh, implementing a public outreach campaign. This would involve the use of innovative survey and public participation tools. Uh, publicinput.com, for example, is, is a survey tool available through the Rockingham Planning Commission that generates very high response rates um, compared to other methods. It's something that we would like to use for this. And as I noted, we will be maximizing public participation very early in the process. That's the part, this phase one's so important for you know, generating that. Um, and it'll help to effectively craft uh, two deliverables from phase one, which is the draft vision chapter I noted previously, and also the master plan template. And you know, on to that, the outlining the chapters and general content areas. Uh, the master plan template is the basis for the phase two work, which is to come. Um, we do, uh, it will do much more than just identify sections of a master plan. It's gonna detail those results of the public participation and the steering committee guidance is what the town would specifically like to address in the plan. It would also help to streamline phase two of the project so it would go much smoother and efficiently. Um, just in summary, uh, as I said, the master plan is required by the statutes, RSA 674 colon one through 674 colon four. The current plan as has been stated is outdated and unmanageable in its current form. Current master plan will help us with obtaining grant funding there are critical sections like coastal management and economic development that are absent and really need to be in a good current solid master plan. And yes, we will return in two to three years to request that additional funding for phase two, but we will be very mindful of controlling cost. If we find any funding opportunities in the meantime that can help defer or reduce some of that cost, we will certainly pursue that. And as I've stated in the beginning, this is a very important investment to our town. Um, while the planning board's responsible to prepare and amend the master plan, this is the town's plan. We have to remember this is the town's plan and the public will have a major role in shaping it. We wanna build momentum, we're excited about this project and we'd be grateful for your support. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Jason. I'm going to go to uh, Ms. Barnes, and then I'll go out to uh, Ms. Wolsey, a comment on, uh, on Article 10. Um, yes, Regina Barnes, I just wanted to thank Jason for that presentation, and I just wanted to reiterate that I feel that not having the master plan updated for the town of Hampton um, has a lot of effects, the adverse effects that people might not see. I also feel that working on a new master plan will help regenerate the relationship between the Board of Selectmen, the Zoning Board, and the Planning Board. I hope that the Board of Selectmen and all those boards can work together because I feel as my first term of Selectmen that I've noted a lot of times it seems like the Board of Selectmen have to react to situations. And I feel that part of that is due from not having an updated plan. It goes back to pretty much 1985. And when I first became a selectman, I went into Jason's office, and it wasn't even in that binder. It was literally in stacks on his shelf. It's totally, you can't work with something like that. And a plan is very important to determine where we are and where we're going to go. So I hope that the town supports this on March 12th. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Ms. Wolsey? Yes, this, this is a very important article. I strongly suggest that the taxpayers vote for it. Uh, it's a small initial cost. Uh, Mr. Bashan has done an outstanding job since he has come on as the town planner. He needs the tools other than that horrible two foot high pile of old paperwork. He needs modern tools to help him in his job. I have tremendous confidence in him, and I will absolutely vote for this article. Thank you, Ms. Wolsey. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 10? Good morning. I'm Ann Carnaby, Tide Mill Road. And I'd just like to show you what the current trend is in master plans. I can hold one in each hand, and this represents the guide map and the vision and the responsibility per town and their current master plan. These are useful working documents that will help guide the future, and that's what we really need here. Uh, the master plan is a road map. More importantly, it's for the future of your town not ours. It's going to be written by you, the people who live here, and guided by what it is that you see as a vision for what our community should look like. It will enable funding for the roads and bridges that you want. If we don't have a five or ten year master plan, there is nothing to guide our growth. We need the tools which is what the 18,000 is for, to make this possible. A process is something that everyone engages in, but we need the expertise and we need the technology to make that happen in a timely way without bogging down the planning office or any of the rest of us for that matter. So we need to address economic development, natural resources, our heritage and our history are so important to preserve and protect. Remember, it's your master plan. We're just going to make it happen. Thank you, Ms. Carnaby. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Article 10. Hi, I'm Laurie Olivier, 160 Little River Road. I work with Jason in the planning office. I um, just highlighted some excerpts that we have in our current zoning ordinance in, a, in orange, some of the pages that all make reference to a master plan. Many times since I've been working for the town, residents have come in, come in and said, how can the planning board let this project happen? How can the planning board vote to have this? Why are buildings taller than our zoning ordinance? Why did the zoning board do X, Y, and Z? Well, our zoning board and planning board go by three documents, sort of as its Bible. The zoning ordinance, and then the planning board uses subdivision regulations and site plan regulations. Again, I've highlighted numerous pages that say projects should be in accordance with the master plan. The zoning ordinance in evaluating 
standards in relationship to a proposed use should use the master plan. The aquifer portion makes note that future growth should assure availability of unpolluted public and private water, dot, 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 in accordance with a master plan. Impact fees, in accordance with a master plan. Again, this is all just highlighted in orange that makes reference to a master plan. The vision and goals of Hampton should be in accordance with our master plan. So this is all just zoning, there's more pages. Subdivision regs in orange, same thing. The planning board uses these regulations and says, in a nutshell, developments should be considered in accordance with the master plan. Site plan, I'm going on with our master plan. So as Jason noted, our master plan is this big. People comment it sits on a shelf and collects dust. So for our boards and the townspeople to be relying on a master plan to make decisions for projects to go forward, we need a master plan. We never, for the most part, that I am seeing make decisions or include even in our decision letters that we are going to stay in accordance with our master plan, which is the wishes of our townspeople. We want and need this money because it's Jason and I in the planning office, there's two of us. And as Jason noted, this project is huge. We need the assistance of a somebody to come and help us to reach out to the public to get a steering committee going and get a master plan, which is about the size of what Ann Carnaby was just showing, that residents can say, this project can't go forward because or we have concerns because it's not following our master plan. So we would really appreciate people to know that we want to have a document that the people would be creating with the assistance of department heads, staff, planning. We only have a planning office. We don't have a zoning office. It's too, we have a zoning board, but we need the help of everybody to join together to get a document that we can actually sink our teeth into our documents and fall back on our master plan. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Olivia. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 10? severely disadvantaged because it does not have a forward-looking master plan. This means if a developer, potential business, or funding source asks to view the existing master plan, they will be given a 34-year-old volume of approximately 1,000 pages with a vision depicting a town looking backwards to the 20th century. The 2013 Planning Board recognized the need to comply with the RSA mandate for updating master plans and convened a vision committee as a first step. I was a member. However, there was no will to fund an overall revision. In light of today's critical issues, including flooding, infrastructure, sea level rise, and the need to increase the tax base, the current Planning Board and Board of Selectmen concur that professional help is needed now. When the town planner asks the RPC at no cost to the town to help create an efficient framework, given the unworkable state of the existing master plan, a two-phase approach was deemed the best offer, uh, the best way to offer the most economical change, chance for success whether RPC is involved or not. The warrant article before you is the first essential step. No further expense can occur without town meeting approval. The urgency of acting now cannot be overstated. I urge you to vote for article number 10. It is in the best interest of our town. Thank you, Ms. Gravis. Anyone else wishing to be heard on article 10? Mr. Jones, good morning. Good morning. The uh, Budget Committee 
voted overwhelmingly not to uh, recommend this, and I thought their voice ought to be heard at this forum. Essentially, they uh, voted, as I understood it, on the basis that, first of all, we asked what the phase two would cost in terms of a general ballpark. We couldn't get an answer at all. But we did make note of the uh, Hampton Beach master plan, which was done uh, about uh, 15, 20 years ago. And that costs like $200,000. So if we go forward with phase one, you're not just looking at 18,000, you're looking at probably well over $200,000 coming down the road. The other, the other arguments that were put forth was that there was nothing on the list of work to be done in the so-called phase one that we felt couldn't be accomplished by our existing highly qualified staff. And the third reason, and perhaps even more important, was we also took note uh, of the way um, the uh, management and uh, planning board, and zoning board, primarily planning board, has treated the Hampton Beach Area Master Plan as an example of how they treat master plans. The Hampton Beach Area uh, the Hampton Beach Plan, Master Plan, actually calls for a preservation of low-profile buildings. It was back in the days that for decades and decades we had a height requirement limitation of 35 feet. The planning board subsequently ignored that height limitation ignored the Hampton Beach master plan uh, call for a preservation of low profile buildings and approved project after project after project exceeding that height limit. So with that kind of action, one has to wonder of what value is this master plan except some sort of, I don't know, game. I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's basically ignored when it's convenient to ignore it. And of course, it's when it's convenient to bring out the drums and pound the beat on it, it, well, that happens too. But mostly it's ignored. The 1985 document that was referred to, gathering dust, just another phrase for ignoring it. Yeah, the planning was responsible for updating it, and they've updated it over the years. And so you have this stack of papers because of the methodology in which they updated it. If we create a new plan, will they employ the same sloppy methodology in updating that plan, or will we be back once again in 10 to 20 years with another quarter million dollars to spend on a plan? $18,000 is not the accurate cost for this. They're going to come back with a phase two, and they're going to say, well, now that we've invested $18,000, you don't want to waste that. Let's go all the way. I don't oppose a master plan. We do have a master plan. That's a fact. And those who are in authority of, of administering and, and effectuating it I've come up here and said things like, well, it just gathers dust like master plans tend to do. And this is yet another document that we want to gather dust. Apparently, we don't have enough surfaces in town hall to gather dust. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Mr. Lissac. Um. I just have to digest everything I've just heard. Um, the, everybody talks about it as being an old document. And maybe when it was initially adopted, this is the date that keeps being quoted. Um, we have constantly and regularly reviewed the different chapters for updating. Housing, transportation, um, to name a couple of current ones. Um, the planning office is a very busy office. I do want to correct one thing. I believe the height originally was 50 feet down in the main beach area. Um, and originally 50 feet was so it wouldn't be higher than the Ashworth Hotel. Now a lot of people are probably laughing because I'm sounding like my father, God bless him. Um, but the master plan is, 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 has a lot of separate chapters. And all those chapters are pieces that are required by federal and state government. The document that we want to move to is more of an executive summary that talks about the spirit and the jest and the hopes. It's actually not rules and laws. It's just the concept and the theories that we would like to, to uh, project on our community. 
as many voters as there are in Hampton, there is that many ideas. And I think the master plan, as Ian had pointed out, we really want to, there's a lot of technology out there today to gather information, to get good feedback, and try to direct ideas uh, for different parts of our community and what to do. Hampton has changed a lot. Every day there's more people. So there's obviously going to be more building, more demand for places to live, more water to drink. Um, so I, I think this is an important step. Whether we come back with asking for more money for the second phase, how much money that will be, we really won't know until we look at the first phase and see how in detail it needs to be. It's a cog on the wheel when people mention something about impact fees. I know we all go back and forth on impact fees, but without a master plan, you can't have impact fees. So to keep saying it's a very old document, it's dusty and people don't look at it, I challenge that because when people do see it and want to research and find out why it can happen, they go to that document, they look up, and they find out that the planning office has opened up those pages and looked to review that it does fit within the plan. And if it doesn't, we live in the state of New Hampshire, and you have your right to appeal that. And then you would go to the variance, the zoning board, and you would fight with your five pieces of criteria of why it's justified. And then the Vo Board of Adjustment would grant you an approval or denial for your application. I understand where Mr. Jones is coming, the fear of what might cost or how high it might be. But you know, we also have to take the risk of at least spending the $18,000 and designing a scope and a plan to um, complete the project. I, I hope it would never be that high. Anyways, um, thank you very much. I hope you do support the uh, modification of our master plan in Hampton. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lassard. Anything more, Mr. Bichon? Nothing more. All right. Well, um, we're going to move on to Article 11, but I want to remind all here assembled that the full text of articles two through nine are in the hallway. Uh, they are on tripods across from where the Hampton Academy students are selling food and coffee. So if you want more detail, or you want to take a moment to examine any of those articles further, they are available to you in the hallway. We are on to article 11, which is the budget. It reads as follows, Article 11, shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate as an operating budget, not including appropriations by special warrant articles and other appropriations voted separately, the amount set forth on the budget posted with the warrant as amended by vote of the first session for the purposes set forth therein, totaling $28,141,882. Should this article be defeated, the default budget shall be $27,595,116, which is the same as last year with certain adjustments required by previous action of the town of Hampton or by law, or the governing body may hold one special meeting in accordance with RSA 40 colon 13, Roman 10, and Roman 16 to take up the issue of a revised operating budget only. A majority vote is required. This budget is recommended by the Board of Selectmen 311. It is recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 5 to 4, the fiscal impact note from the Finance Department. The proposed operating budget figure of $28,141,882 is an increase of $1,299,570 more than the budget amount adopted in 2018 of $26,842,312. The net estimated 2019 tax impact of the proposed operating budget is 38.7 cents per thousand dollars of valuation. The default budget figure of $27,595,116 is an increase of $752,804 more than the budget amount adopted in 2018 and the net estimated tax impact for the default budget is 22.4 cents per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 11 moved by Mr. Liddell? Is there a second? second. Seconded by Ms. Woolsey. Um, is, there somebody, is there someone from the Budget Committee who wishes to speak to the Article 11? 
Seeing none, is there someone from the Board of Selectmen who would like to speak to the budget? Ms. Wolsey. Mr. Moderator, I'm going to ask for your indulgence a little bit because I, I think this is a very important article and I want to make sure everybody in, in the public and all the voters understand the context. I watched the Budget Committee deliberations and a number of times people's concerns about raising their taxes came up and it's a legitimate concern. What do you do at home when you're looking for your 2019 budget? You're sitting down looking at your checkbook and you're figuring what expenses you have on the one side and what revenue and income you have on the other side. Are you going to be able to pay your bills? I'm going to share a letter with you dated September 27, 2012 to uh, Fran McMahon, Chairman of the Planning Board. Dear Fran, I am writing to you to urge the Planning Board to consider anew the adoption of additional impact fees on new developments to address the burdens they are imposing upon town infrastructure, such as public safety, recreation, sewers, and drains. Pursuant to RSA 674-16 and RSA 674-21, the town has adopted an impact fee ordinance at the 2002 town meeting, Article 11, and amended at the March 2003 town meeting, Article 16. Under Section 4.4 of this ordinance, impact fees may be assessed to new development to compensate the town for the proportional share of capital facilities generated by new development in town, including capital facilities to be constructed or which were constructed in anticipation of new development by the town. These fees can be assessed to meet town needs as well as to address increased burdens on the schools. So far, the Planning Board has only implemented a school impact fee, which was adopted on April 28, 2004, after a detailed study was performed by Bruce Mayberry of School Capital Needs. Ms. Wolsey, I'm going to jump in here. I need a connection to the budget figure. That's what we're talking we're, about. We're I talking money, Mr. We, Moderator. No, we're, we're talking Article we're 11. Talking, we're, we're talking Article revenue. 11. Do revenue. you have a comment for the, for the budget figure? And we have... The budget figure is a figure that needs to be paid out of our taxes with offsetting revenue. The re letter I started reading to you was written by your town manager, Mr. Welch, in September, a couple of months before Mr. Welch and I appeared in person on December 5th, 2014, uh, 20, yeah, 2016, I'm sorry. Uh, to beg the planning board to implement impact fees. Revenue. I have here a printout from our assessing office. They took years 2005 to 2018, and the building value in those years, 13 years, $278 million, $80,700 in building value, we are shortchanging our residents, our taxpayers in this community by not supporting the budget with corollary income. We need revenue. The budget, as stated here by the Board of Selectmen, is what the needs of the town are in this calendar year. But don't forget, you're going to need money coming in on the other side. You're going to need revenue coming in to support this. I don't want to see the burden placed on me or any other taxpayer in this community without offsetting revenue. And for those of you who have your town reports like I do, this 2002 report, and it outlines very clearly the purpose of the impact fees. And this was proposed by your planning board. Okay, I'm going to move to so Mr. Rice. Need, we have so a budget article. I'm sure there's a lot of time support, spent by the Board of Selectmen on... Support the budget, 
but demand offsetting revenue. Thank you, Ms. Wolsey. Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Fred Rice, 15, Heather Lane. I think that most of the residents of Hampton join me in being increasingly frustrated when we go through this song and dance every year when it comes to our budget. Every year, we elect people to run our town. Our board of selectmen and the, the agencies within the town, the staffs within the town, put together a budget for what it takes from a policy standpoint to run the town. We need to do this to make Hampton the town that it is. There's a cost associated with each one of these things, and they propose the cost, which I have to presume is the best one that they can come up with for what it is they want to do. Then those figures go to our municipal budget committee. Now, having been on both and chaired both the Board of Selectmen and the Budget Committee, I can tell you that the job of the Budget Committee is to look at those proposed costs and advise and, and evaluate them and say, is this reasonable and is it appropriate? They're not supposed to touch the policy, they're just supposed to look at what is proposed to be spent and say whether it's reasonable or appropriate. Once they go down through that and they fly spec every single line and they get to the bottom and they say, yeah, all of these look good, that's fine. And we vote on these by a majority vote. Wasn't too many years ago that the only thing we put in the town report was, or on the warrant articles was, approved by the Board of Selectmen, approved by the, or recommended by the Board of Selectmen, recommended by the Budget Committee, and that was it. Now we've gotten to the point where we want to know to what degree did they do it. The degree doesn't really count when you come right down to it, because we work on a majority rules basis. Well, in recent years, the thing that has really frustrated me has been the default budget. The default budget is supposed to be a fail-safe, so that if the budget doesn't pass and you think it's excessive, at least we don't have no budget to operate on. So it falls back to the point of, this is what we're obligated to do. It goes back to last year, plus the things that are thrown in for contractual requirements and so forth. But that's all it is. It's supposed to be a fallback, a safety net. But in recent years, the members of our, some of our boards have weaponized the default budget. And they've started to calculate it in advance. Well, if we do this, we can do this number, we can do that number, and so forth. If we could keep operating on a default budget, like some people think, we'd be operating on the 1945 budget for the town of Hampton, and you know that wouldn't work. You absolutely know that. So let's stop playing the game that we keep going through and dancing around to save a buck here and there. I'm sure that these people in the budget committee, if they could, the majority of them would vote for the lowest possible cost. They're taxpayers too. They don't like to pay it, pay any more than they have to. But let's not get into this game about the regular budget versus the default budget. The people you have elected have recommended that these things be done to run the town and the budget committee has reviewed it and a majority of that budget committee has said yes, these are reasonable and appropriate costs. If you don't like the people that have done that, vote new people in. That's why we have elections. That's why we roll them over. We don't elect a whole new board every year. We roll them over each year. But please, don't jeopardize the town's ability to run itself. You know, every time you do a default budget, the whole staff has to go back again and come up with a brand new budget because they don't have quite as much money, so they've got to redo it all over again. That, imagine how much time and money that wastes having to go back and redo the budget that they've already done one time before. They've got to reprioritize, they've got to reprice everything. I support the, the, the budget that the town officials come up with. That's why we elected them. I might not like it. I'd love to be paying the 1945 tax rates. I sure would, so would all of us. But let's trust the people we elected, let's move the budget, and let's get on with running the town. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Mr. Zanoy, so the question before us is, shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate $28,141,882? What say you, Mr. Zanoy? I am not in favor of it. I think that's overstated or overinflated. I've been through the budget in detail, line by line. There's over 400 lines. Multiple lines are overstated. 
I think the budget process here in this town is flawed. The town manager's review of it, the board of selectmen's review of it, as well as the budget committees. I don't support this article. I will vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Zanoy. Mr. Woodell. Jim Waddell, 190 Kings Highway. I just think it's important that people, the citizens, take a look at this budget and take a look at this budget line by line and make their own decision on what the town needs. You can't just look at the bottom line and say that's too much. You have to decide what does the town need and does this budget follow that. If you, you know, the, the budget process is the department heads make a budget, they bring it to the town manager, the town manager brings it to the selectmen, the selectmen pass it on to the budget committee. The budget committee then comes up with a budget. It is their budget. And when the budget committee comes up with a budget and initially doesn't recommend it, it's not logical. It doesn't make sense. And eventually they did recommend it, but did they do their job? I don't know. But it's the job of the individual citizens to make up the mind of whether they want this budget or not. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Waddell. Mr. Warburton. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Brian Warburton, 24 Sanborn Road, Hampton. Before I make some comments about some misinformation we've just heard, I do want to uh, have a moment of personal privilege. Um, I got elected to the Budget Committee this past year, having been away from public service for a while. Um, I found serving this year with Chairman Jones one of the best years that I have ever served on any boards in this town. And I'll tell you why. For six years, if anybody has followed all the budget meetings like I have, Chairman Jones, and prior to that, not only has done his homework, but he has given to the public more information than many prior chairmen. He has dissected, he has provided through his HamptonBud.com website, RSAs and how they familiarize themselves with how we look at preparing and sending to the taxpayers a budget. And I want to applaud Tim Jones, because he's worked very hard night and day. His attendance has been exemplary. Now to the budget. I hear a lot of people say they watch the meetings. Well, there's a reason why the majority voted five to four, because we had to. Let me repeat that. The Budget Committee has to recommend a budget, whether we like it or not. Mr. Welch supplied information at the 11th hour prior to our last, one of our last meetings. Many of us, and I, me included, were against the budget. Mr. Waddell made comments which, in, in many reference, he was actually right in saying, well, if you're going to recommend the budget, you, you reduce 50000 well, why would you not be in favor if that's all you reduced, right? Well, because I wanted to reduce 600000 but I knew what was going to happen. To Jerry Zanoy's point, this budget process is flawed. What would have happened is they would have paraded in here, added 600,000 back in, and we're here, we're back at square one. The issue that the taxpayers at home need to understand, I believe, after this last year more than ever, we've had a lot of expertise on this committee. We've had a lot of people come in and give presentations to us. I think the real issue is that, for the first time in many years, the Budget Committee asked questions that were never asked. And I think we brought forth a ton of information. Uh, the real issue, and I'll leave you with this, and it's something I plan on revisiting next year. Two years ago, we asked the voters to approve, and it fell short 53%, we needed 60% to be able to have the Budget Committee get at the default budget. That's what needs to happen so that we can recommend a default number, which we don't have the power or the authority to do at this point. I would love to be able to do that. I've had issues throughout on these budgets for several years. <clears throat> I think sometime it would be nice, and I've said it to the schools too, let's give the taxpayers a couple years breaks, right? Let's just kind of get back in time and kind of lay back and say, okay, do we need all this? Our department heads gave great presentations. And if you watch the meetings, 
we asked a lot of questions, much like a lot of the articles coming up. So I just want to say, as a member and proud member of the Budget Committee, I think we did do due diligence, and I think we asked some great questions, and I think the <coughs> message has been said that this is going to be the continued uh, focus as we move through the years. At the end of the day, we are here for all of us, the taxpayers, and by asking questions and delivering answers, that's what we're about. But I wanted to clarify the issue about why the Budget Committee 5 to 4 was recommended, because it would have gone the other way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warburton. Uh, Mr. Jones, so the question before us is, shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate a total of 28,141,882. I know we've had some commentary about process, about impact fees, but I think the question before us, not I think, my opinion is on March 12th, people are going to walk into the polls. Should they vote for this number or not? A yes or no? So, Mr. Jones, can you help us out on Article 11 on that question? Shall the town of Hampton raise and appropriate the amount of $28,141,882? for its budget? Yes, I can. Okay. Vote no. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Anyone on else? On a serious note, <laughs> that is a serious note, by the way, but I did want to uh, You want to elaborate offer, on that? Yeah, I wanted to offer an explanation okay. of some of the thoughts that were given already. Mm -hmm. I've had thoughts about how it's the majority of the voters in town that will decide and so forth, uh, which I find interesting because you see there are two numbers up here. One of these numbers is the default budget. And the town voters did vote by a majority vote a couple of years ago to, to give the authority for the default budget to the budget committee. But that didn't happen, you see. So right away, it's not really true, is it, that the majority of the voters have their set. Of course, the law says it has to be 60%. As you'll recall, Mr. Moderator, I pointed that out when it was incorrectly labeled as a 50% requirement. But that's how the law is skewed uh, I, I, and what I would see to um, inhibit the voters from truly expressing their vote. Indeed, it's actually reflected in the Budget Committee, where the Budget Committee's vote is actually inhibited. We came up, and, I, and I'm an error here, I admit it, o openly. Uh, I put the question to my committee, I'm the chairman, I, I put the question, uh, is this, what's the best number we can come up with for, for the proposed budget? And there it is, there's the number, and, and the committee voted uh, as that being the best number. But that wasn't the right question. The right question, as it turned out, because we were subsequently advised by the Department of Revenue Administration, the right question is, what's the best number the committee can come up with and recommend? That extra qualifier is a, is a big deal. Now, DRA, who claims to be in an advisory organization, also stated that if we fail to actually recommend the number, they will nullify our budget number and grant the authority to the Board of Selectmen for the year. So apparently their advice sometimes masks itself as enforcement, but uh, yet when the DRA suggests to the Board of Selectmen that the second year and subsequent year appropriations for leases, which were only approved by a 50% as opposed to a 60% majority in prior years, should not be in the default budget. The selectmen ignore it, and somehow the Department of Revenue Administration has no ability to nullify that action. Yes, so the people are truly heard. No, they're not. The budget Committee, uh, by a majority vote, in its original vote, when the question was simply put to them, which number do you think uh, the voters should vote for? Said vote for the default number because it's the least abusive. I represent the budget committee. When I say the budget committee says don't vote for this, vote no. Thank you, Mr. Jones. So we've had a change since the last time that we assembled. I'm going to go on a point here, Ms. Wolsey. Since the last time we assembled, the legislature has uh, made a change in this area, and so I'm going to turn to the town manager or somebody on the select board. We are required to discuss the uh, default budget. We're not uh, able to adjust that number. We're not able to amend it, but the law has changed so that the default budget is to be presented or, or discussed, uh, whereas in the past that was not a requirement. So. Uh, Mr. Welcher, is there somebody on the board who just wants to give us a highlight of uh, this year's default budget figure, which is 
$595,116. Mr. Moderator, I'll give you a quick overview of uh, what we have for the default budget. You're correct. The legislature did, in fact, amend the statute, RSA 4013, which governs the default budget and how it's presented to you as the taxpayers and citizens of the community. In a kind of in a nutshell, I'm going to use a solid waste um, budget as a good example. Uh, in, the, in past years, uh, when we considered the default budget and the law allowed it, uh, there was an increase which comes in June or July of each year uh, that's in accordance with the Boston Consumer Price Index, and those costs go up. In the future, because they were not, in fact, voted by a town meeting, we can't add those. So when you're looking at your default budget this year, if, it, if the money that was voted in 2017, because we were currently on a default budget, if that didn't have in it <clears throat> the monies that were appropriated for future cost increases for cost of living items and so on and so forth, then they don't exist. They're not in the budget. So if you would approve, give you an example, if you approve the default budget this year for solid waste, <clears throat> then the 2017 cost increases for solid waste, the 2018 cost increases for solid waste, and the 2019 costs for solid waste won't be there. Those are substantial sums. We're talking upwards of 18%. That's a lot of money on an operation that costs a tremendous amount of money for this community. But those rules have changed. So it doesn't matter really whether the budget committee sets the default budget or the selectmen set the default budget, except for one item. And this happened a number of years ago, and it can still happen. If the authority setting the default budget decides that a particular function conducted by the town is no longer needed, they can simply remove it from the default budget, declare it to be unessential. And it was only a one-time or a, a, an expense that's, that's lapsed, and then we don't need it anymore. That provision's still there. That can be done, but that could take an entire operational cost of the town away and certain subjects that, and items that you currently uh, enjoy as benefits as citizens of the town would disappear. So in a nutshell, we don't have any choice on what we put in the default budget. All increases that occur during the year, unless they were directly voted by a town meeting in a warrant article or in the budget, will not be there. So every year that you default, default, vote a default budget, our costs are going to go down, yes, but the individual items in particular contracts, such as solid waste, the amount of money we have to affect those, those costs is going to go down as well. That was the intent of the legislation. That's what the legislature passed, and that's exactly what you have in your current default budget. That kind of in a nutshell sums up what the default budget does. We can go through each of the items that's in there if you want us to. We have had to look at every single item within the budget Every, every line item, every subline item, and every sub-subline item, and qualify whether or not they qualify as part of the default budget or not. And there are pages of documentation that show for those that do and for those that don't. So it's a very detailed analysis, and it would probably take something close to a half an hour for finance department to go through and explain each and every one of them to you, probably more. But that's kind of in a nutshell. I thought it would be best to use solid waste as an example because it sort of typifies what's going on in default budgeting as mandated by the state. We have to live with that mandate. I hope that explains it, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Welch. Ms. Wolsey? Yes, a brief follow-up. Ladies and gentlemen, nobody did you any favors here. The selectmen prepare an estimate of expenses needed for the current fiscal year. The job of the budget committee is to make the budget to meet, to access any type of information they feel they need. They are the ones who are responsible by statute to make the budget so this town can run. And I will say, I think it's fair to say, Mr. Welch, that the town has provided any and all information needed to make that decision. But if your budget committee is going to represent you represent you in a hard-working fashion, never mind throwing out a figure. The Budget Committee's job was to make that budget, and they didn't do you any favor with a five-to-four vote. Thank you, Ms. Wolsey. 
Mr. Jones, I'm going to give you a caution because I think we're, we're done. Yes. There's been a lot of discussion about process, and I find it to be really just off topic. We have a question. We're trying to educate the voters whether they should support a $28 million budget, and I know there's a lot of people involved in the process. But I haven't heard a lot of it candidly today. Why is it up? What's in there? That sort of thing. But I'll leave it at, at that point. If you're going to get into a rejoinder with Ms. Woolsey about the process, I would ask you to stand down. If you have a final comment, and I think that the, all of us here know how you feel about voting, yes or no, that's all we get on March 12th on Article 11. I invite you to make a final comment. But please keep it to the question. Well, I want to make a, a factual correction, and I have a question as well, Mr. Moderator. Uh, we did not get all the answers <coughs> that we had asked from management. We submitted four questions for legal opinion from the selectman's lawyer, also known as town council, and he refused to answer. So obviously we didn't get everything we asked for. And I, I would like, I would like uh, someone up, up there in heaven to take note of the default budget and the difference with this year's operating budget, or last year's operating budget. I think you'll find it uh, significant. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we are on to Article 12. Article 12, shall the town of Hampton vote to approve the cost items included in the collective bargaining agreement reached between the Hampton Board of Selectmen and the Hampton Police Association, Sergeants, which calls for the following increases in salaries and benefits at current staffing levels over the amount paid in the prior fiscal year. Estimated increase, 2019, for 39 weeks, the estimated increase is $21,275. In 2020, for a full 52 weeks, the estimated increase would be $32,001. In 2021, for 52 weeks, the estimated increase would be $27,528. $27, and in 2022, for just 13 weeks, the estimated increase would be $6,221. And to further raise and appropriate $21,275 for the current fiscal year, such sum representing the additional costs attributable to the increase in salaries and benefits required by the new agreement over those that would be paid at current staffing levels. A majority vote is required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 8-0. Fiscal impact note from the Finance Department. The estimated 2019 tax impact on $21,275 is six-tenths of one cent per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 12 moved by Mr. Bridal? Is there a second seconded by Ms. Barnes? This is one of the articles that by law, RSA 273A, uh, we cannot amend it. We can certainly discuss it and get information about it. And I see uh, Mr. Sullivan, um, would you like to uh, speak to Article 12? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Sullivan, the Deputy Town Manager, uh, and I was one of the uh, members of the negotiating committee assigned by the Board of Selectmen that included uh, Selectman Barnes and Town Attorney Mr. Gerald in negotiating these two contracts. Um, if, if it's all right with you, Mr. Moderator, I'll go over some of the changes or the changes to the cost items that are before you. Uh, we sat and negotiated with the HBA, the Hampton Police Association, uh, sergeants and patrolmen, and uh, it's been a great deal of time going over uh, back and forth on issues and the cost items in these contracts and the sergeant's contract are, um, it's a three year agreement for calling for raises of 2.8, 2.8, 2.8 in each of those three years. Uh, in addition, uh, the starting position or starting rate for a sergeant has been increased uh, slightly. Uh, there's been a negotiated uh, uh, change to the uh, prescription plan in the insurance um, and part of doing that is a transition due to a change from our provider that no longer offers a particular plan um, we've agreed to have everybody move to that plan it's a, a less costly plan um, and there is a stipend in there that helps cover costs uh, associated with that transition period uh, that will cease it there in this contract and those savings will continue into the future additionally uh, there was a change to the um, uh, the detail uh, function um, or the costs uh, for details. Uh, the detail rate was increased 
as well as the, the rate uh, for officers who work in an alcohol-related detail, bar details or something else, um, there's usually a, an increase from the hourly rate due to the risk associated with it. Uh, Mr. Moderator, for the sergeant's uh, contract, those are the cost items um, that we have at this time. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Chief Sawyer. Mr. Moderator, before I make my comments, would it be appropriate to make a motion right now for two other non-residents to speak to uh, Article 12 and Article 13? Uh, one is Attorney Joseph McKittrick from the Town of Rye, who represents the Hampton Police Association, and Officer Coy DeMarco, uh, who lives in Greenland, who is a member of the Executive Board for the Hampton Police Association. I'm going to take those as motions to allow those two gentlemen to speak to us this uh, morning. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Bridal. All those in favor of hearing from Attorney McKittrick and Mr. DeMarco, raise your voter cards. Thank you. Down cards. Any opposed? All right. Thank you. Those gentlemen have the privilege of speaking to the body today. Go ahead, Chief Sawyer. Thank you. Uh, Rich Sawyer, I live at 41 Vanderpool Drive, and I serve a privilege of serving as the uh, police chief in the town of Hampton. Um, these two articles are, in my belief, unnecessary for us to continue the operations of the Hampton Police Department at that level and that standard that this community has come to expect. We have uh, strive for excellence in everything we do. And with that, to develop the staff and the folks coming in behind us that lead this department, we have to have competitive wages and benefits. And if you get down, as the uh, deputy manager uh, told us, we've covered that with this agreement. Um, you know, times are tough, and trying to get people to do this job is becoming more and more difficult. Keep in mind that these contracts also cover our part-time employees that carry a lot of the burden of policing in this community during our busiest times of the year. They are members of the Hampton Police Association. So in order for us to recruit the best people we can, we have to have those competitive wages and benefits. So I would ask for the community support on both Article 12 and 13. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Sawyer. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Attorney sure. McKittrick. Good morning. My name is Joe McKittrick. I represent the Hampton Police Association. And I'm urging the voters of Hampton to approve both of these. These contracts uh, that were a, a matter of cooperative effort. Unlike some uh, visions you may have of unions coming in and demanding things, in this particular case, the, uh, the town came in and demanding and made some demands. And we acquiesced to that. This is the third contract in a row that this union has made concessions to meet and help the town in its, in its budget problems. The uh, raises were kept deliberately to the cost of living that Social Security recipients would have. Uh, the only other changes that we made uh, were to attract people in the summertime with our starting uh, salaries, which were below what you have in the surrounding communities. Again, this was a cooperative effort. I think it benefits both the Hampton Police will help us attract new police officers, and I think it benefits the town by the changes we made uh, in your health insurance. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney McKendrick. Mr. Marco? He's going to speak to the next article. Okay. All right. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 12? Yes, sir. Good morning, Jed Carpentier. Um, I rise in support of the next two articles. Um, I am the president of the Professional Firefighters of Hampton, um, and all of us unanimously support our uh, brothers in arms and the relationship that we've established with the police officers in this town. Um, as is mentioned by the chief, uh, we have a competitive job market in this state, and the job that these gentlemen do on a daily basis, um, we personally hold a tremendous value to that. And I think it's important for uh, us to stay competitive in town here to attract the best individuals to these challenging positions. Um, so we in the fire firefighters ranks will be unanimously supporting this, uh, this article. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carpentier. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 12? Yes, sir. Good morning, folks. My name is Darren Degon. I live at One Back Hawk Avenue. As a former police officer in Aurora, Colorado, and living through 10 years of no raises. I can fully understand what 
it takes to, un to live without raises. Every year you're falling behind. This is a, that being a police officer is a tough job. It's getting worse and worse and worse for these guys. They deserve our support. They deserve the raises. Having watched no raises come through my old department, watching my coworkers leaving for better for other departments that were paying good officers. If we want good officers, if we want good people, we need to pay them. These guys are doing a fantastic job. I have never seen a department other than my old Aurora Colorado part partners. These guys are doing a phenomenal job. So let's pay them. Sir, thank you. Could I get you just to restate your name, sir, for the uh, for the for the town clerk? It's Darren Degon, D-E-G-O-N. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 12? Seeing none, Article 13. Shall the town of Hampton vote to approve the cost items included in the collective bargaining agreement reached between the Hampton Board of Selectmen and the Hampton Police Association patrolmen, which calls for the following increases in salaries and benefits at current staffing levels over the amount paid in the prior fiscal year. 2019, for 39 weeks, the estimated increase over the previous year level is $80,204. In 2020, for the full 52 weeks, the estimated increase over previous year level would be $131,484. In 2021, for 52 weeks, the estimated increase over previous year level would be $129,954. And in 2022, for just 13 weeks, the estimated increase over previous year level would be $30,950. And to further raise and appropriate $80,204 for the current fiscal year, such sum representing the additional costs attributable to the increase in salaries and benefits required by the new agreement over those that would be paid at current staffing levels. Majority vote required. This article is recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0, recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 8-0. The fiscal impact note from the Finance Department, the estimated 2019 tax impact on $80,204 is 2.4 cents per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 13, moved by Ms. Woolsey, seconded by Ms. Barnes? Is there anyone who wishes to be heard on Article 13? Mr. Sullivan? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and uh, with regard to the patrolman's contract, the changes are, are identical to what we discussed in the sergeants. There is one other, so again, it's a three-year agreement at 2.8, 2.8, 2.8. There is an adjustment in the wages of part-time officers who are full-time certified and work as part-time. There's an increase in the hourly wage uh, stipend for those folks to encourage those folks to come on board or to stay on board, and uh, we can benefit from their experience. Uh, the insurance change is the same, and the other changes are non-cost items. Uh, the board and I would uh, urge you all to support this and support our officers. Thank you very much, Mr. Monterey. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 13? Mr. DeMarco. Hello, Clay DeMarco, uh, Greenland, New Hampshire, uh, until recently, Hampton, New Hampshire. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you to the public and to the board for allowing me to talk. Um, also, thank you to both the Budget Committee and the Board of Selectmen for unanimously supporting this contract and understanding that it's a mutually beneficial agreement for both us and the taxpayers as well. We've made health care concessions to help ease the uh, tax burden on the community, and all we've asked for is what we consider to be a very fair and reasonable wage increase, as long as minor adjustments to shift differentials and things like that. I've had the privilege of uh, being a police officer in this town for uh, just under six years, and in doing such, I've met police officers from all over the country, whether at funerals or training, and I continuously get comments about the law enforcement in this town. We work extremely hard to protect this community. If you call us, whether it's for your neighbor's barking dog or a loved one suffering an overdose, we're coming to try to help you. So I just hope that come election day, you can help us and uh, vote yes on those two articles. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Marco. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 13? Yes, sir. Uh, Mike Edgar, 7 Anne's Terrace. I wanted to speak uh, in favor of both Article 12 and 13. I think it's important to have a, a long-term type of uh, agreement. Three years is, is great. Some ways I like to see more, but uh, it gives the stability that we need. 
Uh, the police force we have, I've seen what they do. They're great. Their training is fantastic. They help tr in some ways uh, our leaders in, the, in, uh, in our state and area for the training that they provide. Uh, we really need the stability, especially when we talk about the way we have our uh, uh, boom in the summers. And we, we need uh, well-trained people to come in. We have to be able to attract them. So uh, I hope the, uh, the town will, uh, voters will support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edgar. Anyone else? Mr. Page. Yes, Nathan Page, 200 Drakeside Road. Uh, I'm not a member of law enforcement. My interaction is usually with the blue lights in my rearview mirror. But the, uh, that being said, we need good people to do this job. And in order to have good people, we have to pay them well. And our police department does an outstanding job. And I'd like to encourage my fellow residents and taxpayers to uh, vote for, the con for both 12 and 13. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Page. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 13? Seeing none, we'll move on to Article 14. Shall the Town of Hampton vote to adopt the optional tax credit for combat service under the provisions of RSA 72-28C in accordance with the procedure of RSA 72-27A? with said exemption to be $500. The tax credit for combat service shall be subtracted each year from the property tax on the qualifying service member's residential real estate, as defined in RSA 72 29 Roman 2. To qualify for the tax credit for combat service, a person shall be a resident of this state engaged at any point during the taxable period in combat service as a member of the New Hampshire National Guard or Reserve or a reserve component of the United States Armed, First, Armed Forces called to active duty. For purposes of this section and in accordance with the Internal Revenue Service Publication 3 Armed Forces Tax Guide, combat service shall mean military service in one of the following areas. A, an active combat area as designated by the President in an executive order for which the service member receives a special receive special pay for duty subject to hostile fire or imminent danger as certified by the Department of Defense. B, a support area as designated by the Department of Defense in direct sustainment of military operations in the combat zone for which the service member receives special pay for duty subject to hostile fire or imminent danger as certified by the Department of Defense. C, service in a contingency operation as designated by the Department of Defense for which the service member receives special pay for duty subject to hostile fire or imminent danger as certified by the Department of Defense. The application for the tax credit shall be accompanied by the service member's military orders and shall include such information as may be required for the assessor's office to verify dates of combat service. The service member shall be eligible for the credit in each tax year in which the combat service occurs, but the credit may be prorated in the second tax year based on the duration of combat service. The tax credit for combat service shall be in lieu of and not in addition to the optional veterans tax credit under RSA 72 28 or the all veterans tax credit under RSA 72 28 B. A majority vote is required to pass Article 14. It's recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0. Motion to open discussion on Article 14. Do I have a motion? Motion uh, moved by Mr. Bridal. Do I have a second? Seconded by Mr. Woodell. Is there anyone who wishes to speak to Article 14? I see Mr. Rice. Would you like to be heard on Article 14? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Fred Rice, 15 Heather Lane. Uh, I rise in strong support of this item. But I'd like to clarify it so that everybody else can enjoy the same degree of strong support. Uh, we have other items that compensate our veterans, and this is not the same thing at all. Uh, right now, we have the uh, optional veterans tax credit, which meant that somebody was that served for 90 days on active duty and received an honorable discharge and served during certain designated time periods was eligible for the property tax credit. Uh, a couple of years ago when I served in the state legislature, I was the prime sponsor of a bill to extend that to take away those time periods so that everybody who served for 90 days and had an honorable discharge on active duty and, and got an honorable discharge would be eligible for the tax credit. The basis of that being that everybody who served should be eligible, not just those who served in certain specific times, because uh, all service 
is, is uh, laudable. This is a totally different thing. This is when you call up the reserve or the, the National Guard and they go on active duty and they are eligible for this property tax credit in the year that they go. So if somebody is called to go to what is called a combat zone, then they are eligible for the property tax credit during that year. If they go for something from September of one year into the, the next year, uh, March of the next year or something like that, they, it'll be prorated uh, in, those, in, those, in that second year. Um, or it may be probated, uh, prorated. Um, but one thing I think that is important, this is not necessarily for being in combat. Doesn't mean they should not be compensated and recognized for their service because that's the important element of this. But just so you, everybody understands that this is not for combat is when you're shooting at the enemy and he's shooting at you. I will tell you, I'm a combat veteran from Vietnam, and yes, there's a big difference between serving in the stockade uh, back that happens to be at the base camp. Uh, the, re the green zone in Iraq was a, was a fortified compound of 20,000 people and uh, 20,000 American troops who never left, but they were in a combat zone. This is a similar type of thing, and it covers a number of areas. Uh, the combat zone could be anywhere in Afghanistan, anywhere in Kosovo, you know we're not having a shooting war in Kosovo right now. The Arabian Peninsula, all of the Gulfs, the, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Oman, the Arabian Sea, the Gulf of Aden. You know we're not shooting there. The Navy is serving there, though, and it's considered as a combat zone. Um, the Sinai Peninsula, uh, all of these areas, there's no active combat going on, and we have advisory troops over there, so that very few of them are in combat, 10% of all the troops who ever serve in a forward zone actually see combat. That does not mean that they are not worthy of receiving this same credit for their service. Remember, it's the service. These are the guys that don't get to come home that night uh, and, and sleep on clean
to be used only to replace firefighter turnout gear, personal protective equipment. A majority vote is required to pass Article 17. It's recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0. It's recommended by the Budget Committee 8-0. The fiscal impact note from the Finance Department is a zero tax impact. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 17? So moved. moved by Ms. Woolsey, seconded by Mr. Bridal. Who would like to be heard first on Article 17? Sir? Yes, sir. Our Chief, Chief Ayotte. Thank you very much. I'm bringing my model with me today. This is Firefighter Adam Mills, if you don't mind. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. I am your Fire Chief, Jameson Ayotte. This is Adam Mills, who's uh, representing what we have for fire equipment. Today, we're discussing the purchase of a second set of fire gear or turnout gear for firefighters. Our primary sets are being replaced as we continue on through. In 2009, there was a, a AFG grant that was received by the town of Hampton that allowed the purchase of 33 sets of gear. That was a total then of approximately $64,000. Now to replace 40 sets of firefighting gear, the total will be upwards of $165,000. Our gear protects us from all forms of heat and other um, insults and injuries. It's created to, designed to protect us from the environments that we're going into during firefighting. The second set of gear is essential because as a firefighter fights a fire in a smoky environment, they're exposed to significant amounts of chemicals. Uh, these chemicals stay and they permeate through the gear, so that gear must be laundered in an effort to do the best we can to re remove carcinogens from the gear and also prevent the exposure to our firefighters. It's essential to get them into, the, into our uh, extractor device to remove as much of the material as possible. When that happens, it takes several hours to wash, then dry the gear. This gear is fully functional throughout the time that they're, they're operating, and they need to be fully functional firefighters throughout that time, so they need a second set of gear to be able to put on while this first set's being laundered. I'm gonna show you and demonstrate real quick what we're looking to purchase. You see my helmet over here, made of leather. We also have plastic ones. This is designed to protect the head. We have a jacket. Pants and boots, which are hanging down below. But if I can, I'm gonna steal this from Adam. I'm going to verify it. Right inside the label, it says that firefighting is an ultra-hazardous and ultra-dangerous job. Nobody that took this profession thinks otherwise. Since the days of the bucket brigades, it's always been ultra-hazardous and ultra-dangerous. Not my terms. However, what I can tell you is that as time's moved on and the fuels have changed, plastics that are burning right now, different um, chemicals that are being sprayed onto materials for fire retardants, they're exposing the firefighters to a greater deal of carcinogens. We're seeking to replace um, some of the gear that we have right now as primary sets, and this article as, uh, assists us in replacing and offering a second set to all firefighters. So we ask your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Ayotte. Okay, wait, wait, Sir. don't go away. I'll be right where's behind that, you. Where's that label? Right inside. Okay, I want the, uh, the audience to see that, and I want the viewers at home to see that. These outfits, this turnout gear, is done for each firefighter, some are tall, some are short, some are a little heavier, some are thinner. This is tailored specifically to the individual who's going to be wearing it. So it's not like going in and buying a shirt off the rack. This is very important for the safety of our firefighters. We have about nine or 10 this year who need to have their gear restored, um, get brand new gear. Uh, and that doesn't count the secondary sets. We've been, we've been not very uh, prudent or timely in paying attention to the gear that these men and women wear when they go out to fight fires. We shouldn't have to be buying nine or 10 sets in one year because you had a whole bunch bought at one time and then all the rest kind of sat there. We've got a department, and right now there are nine, I believe, nine sets that need to be replaced. The men are still wearing the outfits from 2009. These people are going out and risking their lives in very, very unpleasant conditions, and they need to be protected. Now, we have women on the fire department now in this modern age. These individuals are all different. Every one of them is a different person. And that outfit has got to be tailored 
to the people who are going to be wearing it. This gear is critical. I want to see this fund established so that there is an orderly transition. And by the way, they need two sets of gear. And the secondary sets have really been ignored over the years. They need, if they come back from working fire and there's another fire that comes up, they need that second set of gear. This is expensive, but it's desperately necessary to protect these men and women. So I want to see an orderly progression now that we don't have to go fishing through the budget every year. Just add the money on a regular basis to this capital reserve fund so that we are protecting the men and women that we are sworn to protect as a community. I want to see these outfits properly set up for each man and woman in that department and there's no excuse for not protecting our firefighters. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wolsey. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Mr. Carpentier. I was hoping for the added support up here of Avon, but uh, uh, again, Jed Carpentier, uh, President of the Professional Firefighters of Hampton. Um, I want to first off start off by thanking the Board of Selectmen and the other elected officials that unanimously uh, supported this article. Uh, it shows that everyone recognizes the absolute necessity of this article for us to be able to do our jobs in the safest manner possible and provide the best service to the citizens of the town of Hampton. Uh, I might reiterate some of the things the chief had already said, but uh, the goal of this article is to get every member who has potential to operate in an environment that could be immediately dangerous to life and health, uh, a second set of turnout gear which is the protective clothing that you saw Adam demonstrating up here. Uh, we are faced with a couple of challenges. First, as you heard, a large percentage of our personal protective equipment was purchased in 2009 through a federal grant. Uh, and that gear, as Ms. Wosley said, is custom to each member who, uh, who wears that gear. The industry standard for personal protective equipment for firefighters is that the gear is to be retired no more than 10 years from the date of manufacture unless there is a specific reason to retire the gear earlier. Um, the industry standard from our manufacturer, Globe, um, they back up the um, industry standard recommending the 10 years for replacement. If anybody needs to reference that, that's NFPA 1851. It references it in Chapter 10. Secondly, um, per best practice and per our own internal policy, firefighters have to be decontaminated when they return from operating in those environments that are immediately dangerous to life and health. Now the town has been, uh, we're, we're fortunate enough to have the equipment to clean our own gear internally, um, but that takes time to cycle a, ho a whole shift of firefighters um, through to get their gear cleaned, dry, and back in service. We can't operate, uh, we can't clean everyone's all at the same time, so it's an orderly function to get back to there. Um, <clears throat> and upon, uh, upon return from a structure, oh, sorry, uh, thankfully, uh, sorry, got a little off track there, I was rolling. <laughs> um, long story short, that gear protects us, and um, whether, it be dam whether it be contaminated from an, a, an environment by carcinogens or toxins or whether the gear be damaged and have to be pulled out of service because we were extricating a patient from a motor vehicle accident. Um, this, this gear protects our members and allows them, again, to do their job as safely as possible and provide the highest level of service to the people of town. Um, it allows our members uh, to remain at a constant state of readiness and respond safely for the um, citizens of Hampton and the tourists that visit us throughout the busy season in the summer. This article is truly vital to your fire department, fire department's ability to maintain that constant state of readiness. Um, thank you again to the Board of Selectmen and the other elected officials for their unanimous support, and I would love to see a unanimous vote from the public for this vital piece as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Carpentier. Mr. Warburton. Mr. Moderator, uh, I'm so proud to be supporting this article and how it all came about, and I want to 
uh, commend the, the fire chief and Jed Carpentier. You know, these discussions actually started in this room at the deliverer session last February when I had a few conversations about, you know, the turnout gear and how important it is for safety reasons that we need to have our firefighters have the best. Throughout the remaining months, through Chairman Bridal and his board, through Chairman Jones, the budget committee, in collaboration with the fire department, and as Mrs. Woolsey showed today with the demonstrations uh, uh, and how important it is, what a great result we had. There wasn't, there was very little, um, matter of fact, there was no opposition to this, and even the discussion was no, not at any great length because we knew how important it was. The other thing you should note is that the Budget Committee was very much in favor of the other avenue of this, and that is taking it under the, um, out of the undesignated fund balance, because we felt for safety reasons, that's when you should use the undesignated fund balance. So I congratulate everybody involved with this. I highly endorse this. I, I think it's, it's such a great thing, and our, our men and women of the Hampton Fire Department need this, so I urge you all to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warburton. Mr. Bridal. Yes, Russ Bridal, 225 Toll Farm Road. Speaking as a 30-year firefighter in this town, you know, back when I first started, when you had a night hitch, you bought it yourself. And you wore that thing until the thing was worn out because they were expensive. The department now does that. Back when I was a firefighter, you had your night hitch out, you had a choice of either night hitch or three-quarter boots. The night hitch, you took up, you put it next to your bed, or they at your home, or you're at the station, and when you went out, you jumped in it. Did we ever wash them? Nah, it, was, it looked better if they were salty and they were all dirty. You know, um, we have kids come into our fire stations all the time for classes. What do they want to do? They want to put their fire gear on. <laughs> Finally, the fire services come around to the fact that there are carcinogens out of it. And I'm getting very tired of burying my friends. Guys that have worked for their cities and towns for years, some, not many years, and they've, they've died to cancer. And they're finding more and more that people are dying from cancer that they have got on the job. And we need to stop that. And one of the ways we can do is by protecting them, giving them better gear, cleaning it often. If you want to go to YouTube, there are some pictures out there of gear being cleaned and see the stuff that comes out of them. It'll make you sick. So I encourage everybody, support this article. Make sure these guys have the clear and safe equipment that they can have so that it will be able to protect us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bridal. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 17? Mr. Jones. The budget committee was uh, early on in support of this concept of having a second gear for each firefighter. I'm happy that the Board of Selectmen came up with this one article to effectuate that. Um, it is not just a matter of firefighter safety, although I don't want to minimize that. It's a matter of public safety. If they go out on a call and they come back an hour later, another call comes in, they don't have the gear ready without a second set. So there's a delay in that response. So you're at risk. So vote yes on this, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Anyone else? Mr. Emmert. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tracy Emmert, 207 North Shore Road. Uh, I would uh, comment that in my last uh, term in the legislature, we revised the statutes that supported the uh, firefighters as far as cancer. Uh, and firefighting, not only on active duty, but through retirement. Uh, one of the things that came out of testimony that I was quite surprised at is most of us have the impression that the firefighters' boots and gear are sitting there and they jump out of bed right into them and off they go. That's no longer the case. They, can't even, they, they cannot bring that gear into the residential part of the fire station anymore. So they, I mean, dumb me, I'm, I watch television and firefighters are jumping in their gear. That doesn't happen anymore. The gear has to, to be out of the residential area. So the, the cancer in firefighters is a real thing. I think the state has stepped up and supported the concept, uh, and I hope you support this Warren article. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Emmert. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Yes, sir. Mike Brillard, 8 Pine Road, Hampton, New Hampshire. 
Um, I'm one of the gentlemen, uh, amongst the gentlemen and ladies in the department, that I'm one of those nine people that my gear are gonna expire in a couple of months. I just wanna say a couple of things, don't waste a lot of time. Um, my second set of gear is supposed to be less than 10 years old. I think it's 21 years old. And that's the gear that I go into fires with every day. I'm a lieutenant on the department, and the most important thing to me is the men and women that work with me and for me go home safely at night. So I, I'm not asking you, I'm begging you to support this article so that every member of the Hampton Fire Department can go home safely at the end of the night to their families. Thank you, Mr. Brillier. All right, I think we're all, all done on Article 17, and we will move on to Article 18. Excuse me, Mr. Griffin. I uh, move to restrict 15, 16, and 17. So I have a motion to restrict reconsideration of articles 15, 16, and 17, moved by Mr. Griffin, seconded by Ms. Barnes. All those in favor of restricting those articles, raise your voter cards, thank you, down cards. All those opposed, uh, the, the motion passes. Articles 15, 16, and 17 are restricted from further consideration at today's meeting. Article 18, shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $414,616 for the purpose of employing four additional full-time firefighter EMTs for the Hampton Fire Department over and above those positions funded by the 2019 operating budget and to authorize the Board of Selectmen to apply for, contract for, accept and expend federal homeland security safer funding estimated to equal $276,405 to be applied against said appropriation. The cost in year two is estimated to be $390,062, with federal funding estimated to be $290,446. And in year three, the total cost is $397,622, with federal funding estimated to be $138,187. Federal SAFER grants pay for salary and benefits. This article shall be null and void if the federal funding is not approved or received. Majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen, 5-0. Not recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee, 2-4-2. Two, two. Fiscal impact note, Finance Department, the estimated 2019 tax impact on $138,211 is 4.1 cent per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 18? Moved by Mr. Bridal. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Wolsey. Ms. Wolsey, would you like to be heard on Article 18? This selectman's article will result in an increase from nine to ten first responders per shift. Permanently. This will mean enhanced protection for the public and safer working conditions for our firefighters. For those of you at the beach, especially in the summer season, the upgraded staffing should result in two working ambulances throughout the summer and a firefighter manning the walk-in first aid station. This increase is long overdue. After over 12 years of ramped up development, this isn't the quaint little community it used to be. Short staffing in the Hampton Fire Department is unacceptable. The good old days where all the firefighters lived in town and the call firefighters lived primarily at the beach are gone. Now the radius for attracting new hires is a good 30 miles. That's quite a commute. I recall incidents on Route 101 heading for the beach when drivers would lose control of their vehicles, skid down the embankment, and end up in the water and under the bridge. I personally witnessed some of those crashes. In those days, almost all of our call firefighters lived at the beach, and they would respond to the scene with their own personal watercraft to effect the rescues. Our brave men and women 
of the Hampton Fire Department routinely risk their lives, their personal safety, as they respond to working fires, medical emergencies, accidents, drownings, mutual aid to sister communities, all the while risking poisoning from airborne hazardous substances which contaminate their garments, their skin, their lungs, and their eyes. As a community, it's time to upgrade our shifts to 10 responders year round. We will do our best as a board to seek out grant funds to help offset the salaries in the next years, but the four positions are critical to this department with or without grants. We will look forward to enhanced revenues from impact fees, impact fees to support all of our departments. And I want to uh, mention to you, as you go by the Uptown Fire Station occasionally, you might want to stop in and look in the vestibule at the tribute that is in there to uh, former firefighter Kyle Jamison, who did indeed pass away from cancer a couple of years back. We need your help with this vote. We need your help with permanent shift increase for firefighters per shift. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Woolsey. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Chief Ayotte. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Jameson Ayotte, your fire chief. And I serve at your, uh, I'm very privileged to serve as your fire chief. Thank you very much for that. I'd like to say that Hampton is a vibrant and growing community. Homes, condos, and businesses are continuing to develop. We're excited to see this growth, but keep a watchful eye on the pace that far exceeds the growth of the services that support it. Hampton Fire Rescue protects approximately $3.6 billion worth of property in town. This amount changes with the fluctuations in the market. Firefighters do not concern themselves with the assessed values. They will respond and give their very best to extinguish fires, regardless if the property value is $100,000 or a million dollars. We're very concerned with the size of the buildings. Rise and fall in the market value can change daily. The volume is fixed and endures. Firefighting in larger structures requires more people to perform the tasks needed to extinguish the fires. New buildings take many forms. Since 2005, 15 new roads have been installed. 102 new housing units have been erected on these roads. Many seasonal uh, hotels and motels have been demolished and replaced with multi-story apartments and condominium units. Many of these are year-round residences. Some are, um, Commercial and ho hotels and elder care residences have also added to the burden which, which we must respond. Since 2012, Hampton has added 1.4 million square feet of real estate. This, is, this all must be protected, and we have talked about um, the new fire codes and how they better protect the buildings that are being erected right now, but as you will know, uh, fire departments by state law do not have purview on one or two, uh, one or two family structures, only on commercial structures. Um, with firefighting in these structures requires personnel to accomplish this goal and bringing firefighting
or does it have to come this year to save for grant? So the procedural question uh, for the board or for the for the manager is if Article 18 is approved, is it put aside or will um, there'll be contemporaneous knowledge about whether the safer grant has been secured or not? Mr. Moderator, uh, in normal municipal financing, uh, the grant will have to be approved before these funds are approved by the Department of Revenue Administration. If they are not at the time the tax rate is set, this, this article will be probably null and void. Okay, thank you. All right. I uh, like to propose a motion on this. An amendment? Yes. An okay, amendment. why don't you read the amendment and then I'll take it from you and we'll see if you get a second. Uh, this article shall be null and void on December 31st, 2019 if the federal funding is not approved for or received by the town of Hampton. Majority vote required. So are you seeking to put that at the end of article? Right, right at the last sentence. Okay. Is there any, uh, so you're putting a date on, mm -hmm. um, right. a, an expiration date on this article of, what was it, December 31, 2019? Yes. Okay. Is there a second for Mr. Zanoy's uh, amendment? Second. I need to see, I, uh, Mr. Jones has seconded Mr. Zanoy's um, amendment. Would you like to speak to your amendment, Mr. Zanoy? Well, no, I think it's self-explanatory. I, 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 you know, I think that if, if let me the, take if, this from you. If me. this, if this article passes, I'd like to know that, you know, we're going to disposition these funds uh, expeditiously and not hold them out for a year or two or three or four, waiting for the safer grant that may be coming. We heard it's coming. We hear it, but we haven't been approved for it, or we haven't received it. I, I thought we'd put some some confines around this article. Uh, and not escrow uh, taxpayer money. Okay, so if anyone else wishing to be heard on the Zanoy Amendment, which uh, inserts December 31, 2019 as a expiration date, Mr. Welch. Mr. Moderator, um, in accordance with RSA 32 colon 7, Roman 7, this article dies on December 31st if in fact it's not implemented because there is no extension in the article to take it beyond that date. So on one hand, you could say it's not necessary. On the other hand, you could say it doesn't conflict with state law. Conflict. Okay. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Mr. Bridal. I'm going to ask you to step aside. Uh, Mr. Zanoy, we're... Oh, I, I wanted to make a comment on No, you were, we're on to um, other folks on your amendment. Yes, I, don't, I just don't know how this affects the, the intent of the, amend, the Warren article. I would be, uh, I would concern, you know, we've had a government shutdown and that's affected stuff that's going on with the government, and we've got government grants here. And there could be another one coming up that we don't, have no clue on. So I think the way it was written before was fair and adequate, and uh, I think we, that we should stay with that. Thank you. All right, Ms. Bridal. Anyone else wishing to be heard on the amendment? Just the amendment? Yes. Mr. Jones. If I heard the town manager correctly, this is going to expire on December 31st anyway. So the amendment simply makes explicit that which is implicit. So what's the problem here? Just vote yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Anyone else wishing to be heard on the amendment? The Zanoy amendment to amend the article by inserting a expre express uh, expiration date of December 31, 2019. Seeing none, let's have a vote on the Zanoy amendment. If you are in favor of the Zanoy amendment, you'll vote yes. And um, if it passes, those yellow uh, edits will be included. If you're opposed, uh, the December 31, 2019 date will not be inserted. So all those in favor of the Zanoy Amendment, please raise your voter card. Down cards, all opposed. I declare the Zanoy Amendment has failed and we're back to the Article 18 as originally printed. Is anyone wishing to be heard on Article 18 as it appears originally? Good morning, John Kane, 115 Ocean Boulevard, Hampton Beach, New Hampshire. I ask you to please uh, vote on Article 18 for the four additional fire uh, fighters down the beach, which will hopefully bring down the ambulance. Uh, during the summertime, I have been down there um, 
give you one example, seafood festival, not seafood festival, sand castles, when it's about 95 degrees, and right, people dropping left and right. We had our ambulance on the run, we had Seabrook on the run, we had Hampton Falls coming in on the run. There is definitely a need for ambulance down the beach. Uh, personally speaking, I had three interactions this year with the um, firefighters um, down at the beach. Two of them resulted in me taking a ride up to Portsmouth. Uh, the third, they actually stopped at the house, came in with EKGs, and looked at the heart, took the pressure, and done amazing things so I didn't have to go there. But as I look out here, and I know what's going on in the world, we've got an aging population, and sooner you're gonna have some heart problems, back problems, cancer problems, unfortunately, and you never know when that's gonna hit you. And the, having the Hampton uh, firefighters there uh, coming down and making the call, uh, currently we're lucky to have um, EMS or something on the um, paramedic uh, on the three-man crew, and he can come down. But, you know, if you're having a heart attack and you're going down fast, um, that second ambulance, is, uh, the ambulance uptown is great, but those five minutes might kill you. So please support the firefighters down here. We have a growing population also, so they're overwhelmed with what we've got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kane. I'm going to go to uh, somebody who hasn't spoken on Article 18 before I get back to you, Mr. Zanoy. Uh, Mr. Carpentier, would you like to be heard? No, Jerry, you, you have to yield to the people who have not spoken on Article 18 yet. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, again, Jed Carpentier, uh, President of Professional Firefighters of Hampton. I'd like to start by um, thanking the Board of Selectmen for their unanimous support of this article. Uh, I think that's a critical piece to this, and it shows the board's forward thinking ability and the trust that they put in their department heads to lay out a solvent plan. Uh, this article, at the end of the day, is asking the people, what level of service do you want from your fire department? It's really that simple, and that's the question that you need to um, ask yourself when you go into the booth. Our members are not just firefighters. They're not just paramedics. They're an all-hazards response crew. Whenever uh, whenever there's an emergency, whatever your emergency might be, whether it be a fire, flood, medical aid, ocean rescue, or simply some of my favorites, when one of your loved ones or perhaps you just fell down and need assistance up in the middle of the night, and we're, we're there to be able to provide whatever service that you need. Um, all of our members are cross-trained to operate every piece of apparatus that we have and do so on a consistent basis. The SAFER grant, or Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response grant, is designed to add more firefighters to allow crews to operate in the most efficient manner for the public in the safest manner possible for our members. Um, there has been consistent discussion around allocating some of our, res uh, adjusting, sorry, around allocating some of our resources to the beach district to, due to the density of the high value targets down there. Our most valuable resource at the fire department is our people. This article will provide your fire department the resources to provide um, an escalation of services in the Beach District um, with, without compromising crew safety. In closing, we commend the outside-the-box thinking of the board to incorporate federal money to offset this uh, impact for the taxpayers for the increased service that they'll be receiving. Additionally, we support sustainable ways to use our own revenue generated from the services we provide to continually uh, reinvest in our most valuable resources, our people. At the end of the day, um, the voters know, and I hope you appreciate, the quality of work you get from your firefighters. These positions um, would provide more resources for us to provide you the highest level of care in the safest manner for our members. Thank you for your time and your support on this article. Thank you, Mr. Carpentier. Anyone who hasn't been heard, go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, Adam Mills, 14 Fairfield Drive, Hampton, New Hampshire. I'm also a firefighter paramedic <coughs> with the Hampton Fire Department, proudly serving. Just wanna uh, encourage you to get a 
uh, vote yes on Article 17 and 18. Um, other towns throughout New Hampshire have used this uh, safer grant, uh, Hudson, um, Salem, and we're very much in need of personnel, like Jed Carpenter said, without the personnel, we can't do our job properly. Um, thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bridal, on the, um, on the motion. Yes, Russ Bridal, 225 Toll Farm Road. I I've heard some comments here made today that we were trying to camouflage stuff. When this Board of Selectmen brought this up originally, we had two warrant articles. One was just in fact to put four men on and put it on the, uh, the taxpayers. The other one was this safer grant. And as we move forward in our deliberation with this board, we decided that yes, in fact, we do need four firefighters and we've needed them for a long time. But if we were able to get a grant to help the, the taxpayers to be able to get this, that's what we were going to do. So there wasn't any confusion with two Warren articles. We would have one, and we would support going after the SAFER grant. You know, last year, I think we had an average of 56 uh, mutual aid calls coming into Hampton. Going out, I think we had eight. So there's about, f even say 45. If even 30 of those were ambulance calls, that's potential revenue that this town had lost. Because yes, in fact, we do charge for our ambulance. And that's revenue that this town lost on a number of calls. Will it pay for the whole thing? No. Do we need it? Absolutely yes. And I would encourage people, support this. If we can't get the grant, we're not going to get the firefighters. Then maybe next year we'll be back looking for the firefighters directly. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bridal. Mrs. Zanoy. Yeah, Jerry Zanoy, 16 Presidential Circle. Um, I voted no on this uh, because at the end of three years, the fourth year, the town will bear the full brunt of four firefighters. That'll be almost a half a million bucks up. The operational budget will be up by with overtime and callbacks and fringe benefits be close to a half a million dollars, the operational budget will be up by that much. But in addition to that, I just wonder, and to Brian's point about discussion, on a lot of our calls, most of our calls, as I understand it, are ambulance calls. And I think back, I lived in Natick for 10 years for 30,000 people, and they had a, they had a commercial ambulance uh, uh, outfit servicing the town, it serviced the town very well. I'm just wondering, uh, from a cost-effectiveness point of view, if we did a study and uh, asked an ambulance service, a commercial one, to come in and subsidize itself in the town of Hampton, they would be buying the ambulances. They would be supplying the paramedics. And our guys wouldn't have to be out running ambulances rather than fighting fires, if you will. I think this needs discussion. It really does. I mean, we just can't keep spending money. We've got to think of other ways, I think. How do, we, how do we handle what we need to do with the money we have? We do it every day in our homes. It's not done municipally that way. I, it's really frustrating to me. Anyway, I voted this down. I tend to vote no on this. I understand the fire department is a very good fire department. I have no problems with the quality level of it. I've used them a number of times myself. Broke my arm down at the beach. They came and you know, brought me to the hospital, blah, blah, blah. But it's not, the, it's, not the, it's not that that's in my mind. In my mind is, is this going to raise the operational budget by a half million dollars in, th in the fourth year after these grants have passed and long forgotten, if you will? Or are we really doing the right thing now? And maybe this master plan, maybe that'll help cause some of this conversation if, in fact, that passes. But I just wonder, are we as cost-effective as we can be from this paramedic point of view and the ambulance point of view? Can we get serviced as quickly at, at a cheaper cost or a less expensive cost? Have we really investigated that? Have we analyzed that? Do, do, we, do we compare the costs? I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Zanoy. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Mr. Carpentier? Again, Jed Carpentier, President of Professional Firefighters in Hampton. Um, just in uh, reply to Mr. Zanoy's comments about uh, the potential of a private ambulance. I would, uh, you know, we hear, we hear a conversation about local control 
um, which is something that would be given up in that circumstance. I think the comment is somewhat inflammatory by nature, but I do acknowledge the fact that we could look at d additional sources of revenue. Are, are we allocating that in the best way? There's been conversations the boards had to have, made some tough, tough decisions about what role the state plays in this. Maybe that's something that needs to be revisited. This federal grant is a way to offset that. Um, and again, the, the, the revenue generated from the ambulance service, are we applying the appropriate sustainable amount back into our most important resources, our people, something else to look at. So I think there's avenues to maybe address how we do things internally slightly different. Um, and I appreciate your support on this article. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I'm just going to make a comment again about the, the private ambulance service. At, at 10 men on a shift, we are still not up to standard, national standards. That doesn't include doing the ambulance. If you have a private ambulance service in here, how many times does that fire department have to go out on that call? Because a private ambulance service doesn't do auto extrication, doesn't do a lot of stuff. They always need extra help. For the bang for your buck, you have the best, most highly qualified, highly respected ambulance service in this state, right here in Hampton. You know, I, I look at Manchester. Now, Manchester is bigger than us. But in the summertime, they're about the same size. Manchester has 46, 47 people on at a time, 47 firefighters at a time. We have 10 if this goes through. Manchester doesn't do the ambulance service. So I just, I, I want to get that out there that, you know, even at 10 men, we are still not up to the national standard. But our fire department does the best they can with what they have. And will they respond? Yes, they will every time they can. But we need to make sure that they're safe and they have the correct manpower to do it. This does not give us the adequate manpower, but it does go a long way to helping. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Keep it up. James Anaya, your fire chief. Thank you very much, sir. Um, one last closing argument that I would like to make for this safer grant is that these are your firefighters. They start every day as Hampton firefighters. This is not a private organization. They're not a profit-driven organization. As discussed a couple of times now, there is revenue generated by doing ambulance calls. These people do both. They do fire and EMS. There is no bigger bang for that buck. I can tell you that right now. If we do hire in a private company to assist in that world, we still need the firefighters to do fire suppression. Additionally, profit-driven companies have shown and demonstrated time and again that their bottom line is what they're worried about. I can absolutely tell you that every member of this fire department is worried about your safety. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Chief Ayotte. Um, Mr. Jones, and then we're gonna wrap up with Mr. Edgar and see where we end up. I Mr. just Jones. learned that we're not up to federal standards, but I know that we all agree that we have a great fire service, great ambulance service in our fire department, in spite of the fact that we're not up to federal standards, apparently. Apparently we're better than the federal standards, I don't know, but the bottom line is I'm happy with the fire department as it is. Uh, I've been asking uh, on the budget committee now for six years, uh, do you need more staff? The answer's been some variation of no every year, except this year. And we're led to believe that it's just coincidental there's a grant available. I voted no on this because I didn't see the need. Now, there are those who think we can improve our fire, fire department with, with more personnel. And maybe you think you need a, a higher level of service. Then vote yes. I don't think I need a higher level of service. I don't think the town needs a higher level of service, so I'm voting no. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Edgar. Uh, Mike Edgar, Seven Ants Terrace. I'm in favor of this amendment. Uh, I know how highly trained our firemen are. It's actually pretty amazing. Uh, it's also when you go over to the uh, over to the fire station and the bell rings when you happen to be there and then you see the things that are the adjustments that they make on the fly 
it's like a, a well, quite a well-oiled well team. Uh, everybody knows uh, all of the shifts that are going to take place in order to, let's say, man, man the ambulance and who's man in the uh, fire truck changes. They call people in. It's uh, it's actually a pretty amazing thing to see. But we know what we're getting when we call 911. Uh, highly trained people that are really interested in doing their job well, and uh, you know. If we start talking about going to some other ambulance service that might be available at that time, might not, uh, we don't know what we're getting. Um, I really hope that uh, people support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edgar. I'm going to call it right now and just say we've gone at this. Uh, good discussion, pro and con, for over half an hour. All those in favor of ending discussion on Article 17, uh, excuse me, 18 at this time, raise your voter cards, down cards, all those opposed. We will move on to Article 19. I make a motion with strictly consideration on Article 18. Second. On Article 18? Yes. Uh, there's a motion to restrict reconsideration by Mr. Bridal, seconded by Ms. Woolsey. All those in favor, please raise your voter cards, down cards. All those opposed? Article 18 is restricted from further discussion at today's meeting. Article 19, shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $150,000 to engage the services of a licensed reevaluation firm to perform a town-wide revaluation of property in the town of Hampton as required by the state constitution and the Department of the Revenue Administration during the tax year 2019. This shall be a non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 32 colon 7 Roman 6 and will not lapse until the revaluation is completed or by March 31, 2021, whichever sooner majority vote required, recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0, recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 611, Fiscal Impact Note Finance Department, the estimated 2019 tax impact on $150,000 is 4.5 cents per thousand dollars evaluation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 19, moved by Mr. Bridal, seconded by Ms. Barnes. Is there anyone who wishes to speak to Article 19? Seeing none, we will move on to Article 20. Shall the Town of Hampton vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to instruct the Town Manager to appoint a Code Enforcement Officer who, under the supervision of the Building Inspector, would be responsible with the Building Inspector, Board of Selectmen, and the Town Manager for enforcement of all Town Building Codes, Zoning and Land Ordinances, Bylaws and Regulations, State and Federal Laws, Codes and Administrative Regulations. This position shall be a part-time employee of the town who shall report to the building inspector and the town manager and to raise and appropriate the sum of $17,136 to fund the part-time salary from April 1, 2019 with the annual cost thereafter of $22,847 for such position. Majority vote required, recommended by the Board of Selectmen 4 to 1, not recommended by the Budget Committee 1-6. Fiscal impact note from the finance department, the estimated 2019 tax impact on $17,136 is five-tenths of one cent per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 20, moved by Ms. Woolsey, seconded by Mr. Griffin. Who would like to be heard on Article 20, Ms. Woolsey? Yes, this is long overdue. Once again, we're dragging our feet and not doing anything sensible to protect our residents and businesses. Last summer you saw fighting at the beach over parking spots. Uh, people decided they were gonna park wherever they felt like parking and then they're making a mess of the traffic and all this stuff. Planning board requires certain things like certain parking areas, etc. There's nobody out there to enforce them. We're getting huge blocks of grease, grease in the public works uh, uh, well, machinery, because nobody's going around and inspecting the businesses and the grease traps and making sure they're not pouring grease down the drain all over the place. This is costing us money, and it's uh, set up a, a recommendation of what we should do, and nobody enforces it. If we didn't have police officers and we didn't have people enforcing traffic rules and so forth, we'd really be going crazy. It's the same thing for the uh, planning board stipulations. We need to have a, an initial, and I think we need more than one, at least an initial code enforcement officer to handle some of the important things. 
that grease trap inspection is, is really uh, high on my priority list. But we need someone to help us out, to help our planner and to help um, uh, Kevin Schultz in, uh, plan in building. So I hope you will <coughs> consent to vote for this. Thank you, Ms. Woolsey. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 20? Seeing none, Article 20 will appear as printed. Article 21, shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $590,170 for improvements to streets consisting of paving overlays, adjustments to structures to permit paving, repairs and replacements to drainage, repairs and replacements to sewers if needed for pavement repair, repairs to sidewalk and driveway openings, crack sealing and curbing installation, and improvements and repairs to town parking lots and parking areas. Upon completion of the work scheduled in this warrant article, if funds remain unused, the DPW may proceed to the next streets on their priority repair list until said unused portion is spent. Said appropriation to be offset by st the state highway block grant estimated to be $316,231. This shall be a non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 32 colon seven Roman six and shall not lapse until the projects are completed or by March 31, 2021, whichever occurs sooner. Majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen five to zero. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee seven to zero to, to one abstention. Fiscal impact note from the Finance Department, the estimated 2019 tax impact <coughs> on $273,939 is 8.2 cents, 8.2 cents per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 21? Moved by Ms. Woolsey, seconded by Mr. Griffin. Is there anyone who would like to speak to Article 21? Ms. Hale? This article is an article that has been on the warrant for uh, multiple years now. Uh, I think it's important is that this is the money that we used uh, to get the paving done when we were able to, uh, to get the roads resurfaced in town. A lot of people still are a little bit misled thinking that Anne's Lane is finished and that's what paving is. Uh, that is not the case. That project will be repaved in the spring. Uh, the same with Lafayette Road. That is not final pavement. It will be repaved when the drainage project is over. Uh, this money is used to go throughout town uh, in hopes for next year pending anything else that may come up, which is uh, very practical and has happened. Uh, we look to uh, look in the area of Elaine and Richard Street. We have sewer improvements that we want to do first in there. Um, after we make the infrastructure, that's when we come back and pave the roads. Uh, we're also looking at some roads that don't need the infrastructure improvements, such as Picard, uh, Palmer, Sicard, and Barry Streets. Uh, and then Part of this money will also be used uh, on Park Avenue pending a positive vote when we get to the culvert replacements under Park Avenue. Uh, so we look for your support so we can continue working on our roadways. Thank you, Ms. Hale. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 21? Seeing none, Article 21 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 22. Shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $300,000 to be added to the road improvement capital reserve fund created under Article 16 of the 1998 annual town meeting in accordance with the provisions of RSA 35 for the purpose of maintenance and or reconstruction of streets. Majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 8-0. Fiscal impact note from the Finance Department. The estimated 2019 tax impact on $300,000 is 8.9 cents per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 22? Moved by Mr. Griffin, seconded by Mr. Bridal. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard on Article 22? Ms. Hale? Uh, this again is another article that has uh, been on the warrant for uh, multiple years now. This Road Improvement Capital Reserve Fund has become uh, means for us to save up money throughout the years to do the larger projects. Uh, case in point is the drainage improvements, the pavement surfaces, the curbing the sidewalks all along Lafayette Road um, have, were funded last year uh, by this capital reserve fund. Uh, so the money that we're asking for is the $300,000 that gets put into this fund uh, so that we can continue to grow it and look towards the future for our next large project. Thank you, Ms. Hale. Anyone else wishing to be heard on 
Article 22. Seeing none, Article 22 will appear on the ballot as. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to make a motion that we restrict reconsideration on 19, 20, 21, and 22. Motion to restrict reconsiderations on Articles 19 through 22 by Mr. Bridal, seconded by Mr. Griffin. All those in favor, please raise your voter cards. Thank you. Down cards. All those opposed. Articles 19 through 22 will be restricted from further consideration during today's meeting. Article 23, shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $243,165 for the purpose of the following replacement vehicles for the Department of Public Works. One one-ton dump truck with plow and wing, two three-quarter ton trucks with plows, and two sidewalk maintenance vehicles. Replace vehicles to be traded in if deemed to be prudent by the Public Works Director, Town Manager, and Board of Selectmen with said sum of $243,165 to come from the unassigned fund balance. This shall be a non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 32 colon 7 Roman 6 and shall not lapse until these purchases are completed or by March 31, 2020, which is whichever is sooner majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0, the Municipal Budget Committee voted 4-4. Four four. Fiscal impact note, Finance Department, zero tax impact. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 23? Moved by Ms. Woolsey, seconded by Mr. Bridal. Mr. Jacobs, our DPW director, would you like to be heard on Article 23? Yes, thank you. Um, the four uh, vehicles, or three vehicles and two sidewalk tractors that are in this for a total of five vehicles uh, were long-term planned out through the uh, capital improvement plan, um, which we annually submit to the planning board and um, is reviewed by them and then adopted or accepted, if you will, by the town. Um, we don't um, just willy-nilly pick and choose what um, needs to be replaced or, or what's um, up next. In particular, uh, the biggest truck, which is the one-ton dump truck, is a Unit 30 that the department owns. Um, it's been in service since 2002. It's a Ford 450 XL pickup truck or really a, a small dump truck. Um, the issue that the department has with this particular vehicle, and it was benched for a good portion of this year due to uh, repair costs, um, in 17, we spent, the department spent $8,450 repairing it, and in 19, we spent $9,788 uh, repairing it. Um, the, basically, the frame is rotted out on this particular vehicle. As many of you know, if, if this vehicle were, were down in the beach area when there's a uh, recent, like for instance, the recent uh, high tide flooding situation and had to move back snow banks, it's more than your average dump truck. Uh, this particular vehicle is exposed to salt, uh, water and salt usage more than, than even a uh, a uh, commercial pick pickup truck, let's say, uh, up in Dover or some other community where they don't have the environmental conditions we have. Uh, the other two side uh, pickup trucks are also, uh, they're 2004 Silverados. Um, so you can see that they both came in about the same time. One's got 83,000 miles on it and the other one's got 115,000 miles. The, the problem is that at this current rate, on if we were, don't get this article approved, Essentially, every four years, you're rebuying the vehicle again just in repair costs. I don't think that's a wise uh, investment for the community, um, and that's why they've been brought forward. The other two sidewalk tractors, units 53 and 63, are some of the articulating units that you see out clearing the sidewalks. Um, they're not very dependable pieces of equipment. Case in point is we had what? Uh, what I would consider just an average New England snowstorm earlier this week, and the two vehicles ended up coming back in the shop. Matter of fact, one's been in the shop for a week. Um, they um, very mechanically um, have a lot of moving parts, and uh, particularly with a snowblower where it snaps shear pins all the time, that's a common thing in the, in the snow plowing industry. But right now, transmission-wise and um, drivetrain-wise, uh, they're up on blocks. And they, they took up half of the re 
maintenance garage this year for over six months because the parts come out of uh, their Canadian manufacturer with a distribution uh, center out of Maine and the Maine facility was not able to supply us with the parts. So they're actually no longer being supported uh, regionally uh, parts wise. We actually had to reach out to the uh, manufacturing Canada to get some of the parts and then it still took us four or five months. So they're not a very dependable pieces of equipment. Uh, we're looking to service them out and replace them with something uh, basically uh, either a Kubota sidewalk tractor with a detachable uh, front snowblower or something comparable of that nature. In other words, something that's built to be used in this area. Um, we're also looking at three other different uh, manufacturers. We haven't actually specced out or, or picked out what that final piece of equipment would be. But these are very independent, undependable. And what we see is that regularly from you folks, you experience it, you call and say, hey, how come the sidewalks aren't done yet? And that's the, that's the reason uh, they weren't done and can't be done is the equipment keeps breaking. So I take questions. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 23? Uh, Ms. Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Regina Barnes, 95 Presidential Circle. I just wanted to clarify something for the public. When this article was first presented by town management, uh, the town manager was asking for another appropriation, which would have had a tax effect for this year. And I suggested to the board, and they unanimously agree, that we take it out of the unassigned fund balance. So that came from me. And I feel is the same reason, some may not agree, that taking it from the unassigned fund balance will, the money is already there, tax money already exists, so we can use that for something that is detrimental for our public works department. And they really need this new equipment, the amount of money that's going toward maintenance on an annual basis, that's just throwing money away, so. I think for safety reasons, much you know, similar to the firefighters' safety gear, this is safety for our department, ensuring that they have machinery that works well and can get through what we needed to do whenever snowstorms or whatever may occur. Because without having a road available to our police and fire departments, nothing can get done. And I don't think that this town can function an hour without public works doing what they're supposed to do. And I really like to see this Warren article get passed. As I said, there's no current tax effect. So I hope the voters choose to say yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Anyone else? Mr. Lassar? Um, hello again. Um, I don't know what to say each time I approach this, but I'll talk about the subject because it's the easiest thing. Um, this is frontline equipment. I don't know if anybody saw that this is like 2002, 2004 pieces of equipment. Um, not all this equipment just goes forward, it goes backwards too, so you can add more miles onto the drivetrain and the engine for reverse when they're plowing up parking lots and going down different streets. Um, when the weather is nice, we all enjoy walking on the sidewalks and it's good when they're plowed. We have that warm February day that we wanna get out and stretch our legs and get out of the cabin. Um, but like this one, what, 04 and we're in 19, so that's 15 years old. Um, the pickup trucks were what, 02s? Uh, 04s, okay, so that's 15 years. I thought I saw an 02 on these one tons. Yeah, so um, I just hope that people will support this article so that Public Works has good, reliable equipment to make our streets and roads safe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lestard. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 23? Seeing none, Article 23 will appear on the ballot as printed. Today I have the, uh, the benefit of assistance um, from Representative Pat Bushway. She's agreed to uh, take a few articles um, in today's meeting. So I'd like to bring her up to the podium and uh, let her take the next several articles. Pat. 
Thank you. Article 24, shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $245,500 for the purpose of replacing the Eaton Park culvert and the associated arch pipe culvert crossing under Park Avenue to Kids Kingdom parking lot as the existing Eaton parking lot cul culvert is deteriorated and safety improvements into Kids Kingdom need to be made and for the replacement of the major existing 24 inch drainage culvert under Park Avenue with two culverts to provide adequate flow for the drainage received from the area of High Street, Toll Avenue, Academy Avenue, Tuckfield, Park Avenue, and Winniconnet Road, as the current culverts are undersized and deteriorated, causing drainage obstructions and reduced flows, and cannot be constructed as a larger size culvert without interfering with an adjacent sewer main. The sum shall be used for the engineering, design, permitting, and construction of the culverts. This shall be a non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 37 colon 7 Roman 6 and shall not lapse until the culverts are installed or by March 1st, 2022, whichever is sooner. Majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Select Selectmen 5 to 0. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 8 to 0. Fiscal impact note provided by the Finance Department. The estimated 2019 tax impact on $245,500 is 7.3 cents per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 24? So moved. Is there anyone wishing to speak on Article 24? This article has come about uh, based on uh, recent flooding events that we've had, some investigation that we've done uh, this past year and in future years before. Uh, the culvert that needs to be replaced uh, that you're seeing on the screen now from uh, Eaton Park area is a 24 inch culvert that comes from basically the uh, parking area to the sidewalk and then goes across the street to a head wall uh, and out uh, into the swale on the other side of Park Avenue. That flow that is coming from uh, the Eaton Park uh, parking lot is also taking flow, uh, as the Warren article states, from uh, High Street, Winniconnet Road, all the way up by Town Hall. Uh, there is a lot of flow that gets into this pipe system, and then it's actually joined uh, with other pipes that come in on uh, the park side of the road. Uh, this project will increase the size of uh, the ability to get the runoff uh, to the outlet. It will also replace the structure that uh, joins all the flows together so that is completely undersized and ultimately with the purpose to alleviate the flooding that goes on uh, and uh, create a connection that actually works um, under Park Avenue. That is part of the first uh, part of this Warren article. Down Park Avenue, um, a little bit further is also a very large arch culvert um, that goes from uh, the stream bed where King's Kingdom is, uh, comes under Park Avenue and again outlets to another stream area. Right now, the culvert that goes under um, <coughs> what you call the driveway into the King's Kingdom parking lot, uh, that needs to be redone. There needs to be some safety improvements uh, as you travel into that parking lot. And then furthermore, as the stream continues down uh, to the head wall and that arc uh, pipe culvert that's there, uh, that is all deteriorated. It is uh, corrugated metal uh, that is rusting out. And in some cases, we can't get through uh, with equipment to actually see how bad it is. Uh, so there's parts of this that have uh, completely deteriorated. The goal here is to get one contractor, um, look at efficiency, looking at mobilization and demobilization once instead of breaking this up into two different projects. Get out there, make the replacement while we can, hopefully in the summer so it doesn't affect the school traffic, and then get in there and be able to uh, pave Park Avenue as it is on our roads and one of the next ones to be paved. And that's what I have. Is there further discussion on Article 24? Hello? Oh. Yeah. 
Yes, ma'am. This is, this is not just smart budgeting, it's very smart planning. This is a very old, this is an old section of town, very heavily settled, and we're still contending with awful leaking pipes and pipes that aren't large enough uh, in, in these areas. So this was, was basically thought of as two separate projects, but it's very, very smart to put them together, and that whole area will benefit. That's a great area just for recreation and residents. Excellent job. Is there further discussion on Article 24, please? Ann Kaiser, 7 Palmer Street, and a member of the Mosquito Control Commission. So I would like to point out that there historically have been problems with mosquitoes at Eaton Park and at uh, the area, the playground areas around there. Hopefully this drainage will improve that situation so they won't be calling the mosquito control constantly asking for extra spraying down there. Also, Kids Kingdom cannot be constructed until the drainage has gone in because they dig a foot in there and they hit water. So you cannot add those, uh, the playground equipment until this is done. Thank you. Is there further discussion on Article 24? Seeing none, the article will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 25, shall the town of Hampton vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to enter into a five-year lease purchase agreement for a Mack six-wheel dump truck with plow, patrol wing, and stainless steel sander in the amount of $210,050 to raise and appropriate the sum of $42,010 to fund said lease purchase agreement in year one, said lease purchase agreement shall contain a non-appropriation clause. Majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen, five to zero. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee, seven to one. Fiscal impact provided by the Finance Department. The estimated 2019 tax Im impact on $42,010 is 1.3 cents per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 25? Motion by Mr. Bridal and seconded by Ms. Woosley, please. Uh, for the record, Chris Jacobs, uh, Director of Public Works. Um, again, we have a, through the CIP program, we've identified the vehicles that need to be replaced. Um, this particular vehicle, is, its time is up. Um, <clears throat> one of the primary, it is a 1997 international uh, truck currently, uh, pictures show. Um, it is the front, one of the frontline vehicles that um, clear the roads for you um, in, in sand and salt. Uh, a number of you people spoke to me today and they said thanks for coming out and sanding and salting uh, their various roads and this is one of the trucks that actually gets that, that job done. Um, looking at the repair records for this particular vehicle, um, in 17, we, we spent 10370 to keep it on the road. And in 18, so far, we've spent $7,234. Um, I think the original purchase price of this truck alone was under 100000 back in 1997. Um, so again, I think it's uh, problematic if I don't bring something like this forward that uh, uh, not only is there capital things like this that have to be paid for, but there's also maintenance. And then we typically sit down with the budget committee and uh, even in the board of selectmen and everyone has commented, why is the vehicle maintenance budgets rising year after year after year? Well, one, it's cost of parts, but secondly, older vehicles. Um, we've, this particular vehicle has 80,645 miles on it. Uh, it's pretty amazing when you figure it never really even leaves Hampton. Um, to hold the price down on a particular vehicle like this, the package, um, the total package price is $210,000. We have 
reached out through uh, Mack Truck with a uh, Kansas bank and they do offer a five-year lease program. Um, it's a lease to own program and we've helped, we've tried to help with the tax rate by getting a lease payment that's only annually $42,010. Sorry, I'm sinus stuff. If I'm gasping for air, I'm trying to breathe and talk at the same time. Um, I want people to recognize that after the fifth year, when we have no more payments for it, we will still have the truck. Um, we're anticipating that these trucks, uh, the previous two that we got, uh, we turned in a couple years ago, had 28 and 30 years on them. We're hoping with um, one that we don't have to wait that long in the future. But secondly, um, it, we expect this truck to be in service for approximately between 15 and 20 years. Uh, with normal and regular maintenance. Um, so it is, it is a five-year payment, 42000 each year, but it's a long-term investment in the town. Thank you. Ms. Wolsey. Yes, um, I'm, I certainly support this article, and I like the tack that we are taking now in the Public Works Department. Instead of having 20- and 30-year-old monstrosities sitting down there in the yard, I love the leasing concept. And at the end of five years, if the, uh, the vehicle, because maintenance costs are huge on these vehicles, mind you, and public works vehicles take quite a beating. So if we can rotate and roll over leases every five years and have proper equipment to help service the town, that's wonderful. And would uh, Mr. Welch please explain the um, non-appropriation clause, because we, we wrestled with this a little bit. Uh, I hope that means that we do not have to have a warrant article in every year for the five years. Uh, sorry. Uh, Madam Moderator, uh, in Mr. answer to the question, uh, that's something that we've discussed with the Department of Revenue Administration. Uh, there is no set protocol for whether or not there should be a warrant article each year. It's up to the Board of Selectmen to make that determination unless statute changes. Thank you. So that will free us from having to have an article every year to continue the lease. Excellent. Very good article. Is there further discussion on Article 25? Article 25 will appear on the ballot as printed. Madam Moderator, I'd like to make a motion to restrict reconsideration on 23, 24, and 25. Motion to restrict. Do we have a second? Yep. All those in favor of the motion to restrict? Cards down. Opposed? The, the motion is, t is carried. Article 26. Shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $91,000 for the purchase of a trash ejection trailer required for over the highway transportation and disposal of solid wastes and recycling collected at the transfer station. This shall be a non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 32 colon 7 Roman 6 and shall not lapse until this project is completed or by March 31st, 2020, whichever is sooner. Majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen, five to zero. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee, eight to zero. Fiscal impact provided by the Finance Department. The estimated 2019 tax impact on $91,000 is 2.7 cents per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 26? Mr. Griffin seconded by Ms. I'm sorry, by, by Ms. Barnes. For the record, Chris Jacobs, Director of Public Works. Um, reasons for uh, needing a sixth uh, refuse trailer. Back in June of 2011, um, was when we started with the uh, town forces actually collecting uh, curbside all of your refuse and recycling. At this time, we received uh, 
uh, three sidearm Packer trucks, and we received six of these heavy duty uh, trash trailers for transporting trash and recycling. What we've seen is a growth in the amount of trash overall that we uh, have to pick up. And during the uh, summer months, or for those that are not aware, we do pick up trash Memorial Day weekend, July 4th weekend, and um, Labor Day weekend, the big holidays. When we have those big holidays, for instance, July 4th weekend, um, we can receive upwards in those two days uh, up to 400 tons of trash. Each one of these trailers only holds, legally by law, uh, about 21 and a half tons. That's about how much we can load into them. So the problem that we have on those big weekends, or the big July 4th week, is actually the ability to turn the trailers over. Uh, the landfill in uh, Rochester, where this material goes to, is closed on a Sunday. So when we're open at the transfer station, we're basically holding the refuse and it can't really be shipped out until possibly Monday. I say possibly Monday because if Monday happens to be a holiday, um, depending on what years the schedule falls, uh, we could actually be in a situation of needing to hold back or hold, contain this refuse for a period of up to two days. Um, what's happened over the last couple of years is when we've run into the situation that we have a lot of extra refuse and uh, the recycling's up and we need more container space for refuse, we've actually been taking your recyclables out into the backyard and literally emptying the trailer on the ground. It is not the preferred method of operation because uh, short term it can attract mice, rats, allows uh, the seagulls to turn over the recycling portion. Um, also, it's double the work for the staff because we end up handling everything twice. Um, and it, it's just problematic. We end up crushing the, some of the glass. It's, uh, it'll, in, in some instances, it takes two or three days and multiple crews to actually clean up the mess. So we've been emptying trailers to then recycling trailers to then refill them with trash um, that comes from all the visitors that we that we get here. Um, so all the good growth that we've enjoyed, all the, um, the fact that we are a five-star beach, we are a destination, um, this is one of those resultant uh, impacts. So we reached out to um, a number of vendors and the, the trailer that meets our specifications and matches to the compactors that we have lump sum $91,000 and was elected to do it at a one-time purchase. And I would say the life expectancy in a trailer like this, we've already had them now, we'll be entering our ninth year, so we're easily going to get 15 to 20 years out of these trailers. The real issue with the trailers is um, the bottoms wear out. Um, recycling is abrasive. Cardboard is abrasive. Cardboard combined with glass is really abrasive. And I wouldn't be surprised that uh, the trailers in the future are going to need uh, new floors welded into the bottoms just to keep them on the road. But as a, as a structural element, as a um, piece of equipment, we do get many, many years out of them. And again, this would just be an investment um, into the in infrastructure to allow us to properly manage uh, the waste that comes our way. Thank you. Is there further discussion on Article 26? Seeing none, Article 26 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 27, shall the town vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $85,750 for the purpose of replacement of the water line that services the Public Works Department office and garage. The replacement of the water line will serve to repair a water leak to the DPW garage and office buildings, as well as complete the first phase of providing fire protection. We'll relocate the current service line away from the wastewater treatment plant facility, will repair the existing leak and the new line to be provided with this appropriation 
will be of sufficient size to provide hydrant service. Any future water line additions will be able to be looped to provide proper flows through the facility, including additional hydrants for fire protection. This shall be a non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 32 7 Roman 6 and shall not lapse until the purchase and installation is completed or by March 31st, 2022, whichever is sooner. Majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Select Selectmen, five to nothing. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee, eight to nothing. Fiscal impact by the Finance Department. The estimated 2019 tax impact on $85,750 is 2.6 cents per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 7? Moved by Mr. Griffin. Is there a second? Second by Mrs. Wolves. As a note before I talk about Article 27, I did want to let everybody know that uh, we have printed up all the slides that we did for these Warren articles and they are on the table out front. Uh, they will also be posted on the DPW website page, uh, a link so that you can read through them uh, and uh, educate for yourselves. This waterline replacement has come uh, on the basis that we determined that there is a leak. Uh, it's a leak in a one inch water line that comes from our wastewater treatment plant area on the bottom left of your screen there and comes around the aeration basins into our main DPW facility. Unlike most leaks, if you think of something water-wise, uh, normally it would crack through the pavement. You'd start seeing water ponding and all those great things. Unfortunately, and I say unfortunately, um, that's not the case because we can't find it. Uh, we don't know exactly where the leak is. Uh, we were able, we know there's a leak because our water bill has gone up um, to the extent uh, probably costing about $8,000 over the year, um, a full year that is. When we looked at trying to locate uh, where the service was, it brought a lot of other issues to light. Um, if you aren't familiar with our facility and the wastewater treatment plant, um, I don't know that you could completely appreciate the spaghetti that is underneath from every single basin building um, structure that is there. There's a lot of utilities that are involved in public works operation, uh, especially the wastewater treatment plant. And locating one one inch water line a uh, distance of, you know, over, I don't know, 1,000 feet or so um, is not the easiest of tasks. Uh, it also brought to light that our current main building where we store uh, our frontline vehicles, those ones that plow the roads, as well as our vehicle maintenance bay and our offices that we operate at, um, does not have any form of fire protection. Uh, there have been towns um, north of us that have lost their fleet due to fires. Uh, so this repair uh, allows us to sort of look to the future, but also accomplishes the savings right off the bat of not paying uh, this increased water bill, but also sets us up to be able to have a fire hydrant at the rear uh, of our main building facility, something we do not have now. Uh, the article itself is for just the construction of an eight inch line that would go from the back uh, there is a water line, uh, an existing four inch line uh, in an easement. It would come through the rear of our site, allow us to place the hydrant and enter our building. What this will do is also set us up for a future looping connection out to Hard Arts Way so that we in fact can go building to building and make sure that we have the fire protection we need. Is there further discussion on Article 27? Seeing none, Article 27 will appear as printed on the ballot. Article 28. Shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of Two thousand four hundred and forty five and two hundred and forty one dollars for the purpose of replacing approximately eight hundred and seventy two existing street lights with more efficient energy efficient LED lighting 
further to authorize the Board of Selection to enter into an agreement with Affinity LED Lighting and accept an expected rebate from Unitil Electric in the amount, approximate amount of $122,120. Majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen, five to zero. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee, eight to zero. Fiscal impact note provided by the Finance Department. The estimated 2019 tax impact on $245,241 is 7.3 cents per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on article? So moved by Mr. Griffin, seconded by Ms. Woolsey. Sir. Again, for the record, Chris Jacobs, uh, Director of Public Works. Um, in an effort to find ways to do what we do better or uh, more cost effectively, um, became aware to the department uh, about 18 months ago that a number of other communities had latched on to uh, the idea of replacing all of their LED, all of their street lights in town with LED lights. Uh, not wanting to be the guinea pig, I let Dover, Summersworth, and Rochester uh, go first. They've um, one of the communities actually bid the project out, and then the other two communities uh, got approval from their various boards and councils to uh, work with the same vendor. So all three of those communities have now changed over all of their street lights to LEDs. Uh, the partial first reason would be to do it is we're going to save on electricity. Right now, the street line, the last number I have in my brain is uh, $213,000 for electricity. It goes up several thousand dollars each year. When I first got here, it was just a shade around, or just under uh, $200,000. But for 245, dollars they'll change um, all 872 existing street lights. Um, the company that those other three communities and a number of other communities, including New Hampshire DOT, are using Affinity uh, Lighting. Um, it is a um, veteran-owned company, and they do employ um, apparently predominantly and only uh, veterans in the uh, manufacture of these uh, or assembly of these fixtures. And the company is located in Dover, so it is a uh, it's in keeping, if you will, with. Uh, making New Hampshire go forward. Unitil Electric has shown their support of the project and that they're willing to uh, waive or grant back to us and, LE and Affinity Lighting uh, a grant amount of 122,120. This is essentially half of the cost that they have uh, riding, if you will, on the fixtures that are already in the, in the, uh, on the poles, but they were willing to let this go by for very simple reasons. Uh, LED lighting works, uh, it saves us all, it, it apparently meets with their long-term uh, fiscal goals also to um, you know, keep, this, keep uh, the communities uh, in line or, or help them stay in line with respect to their electrical bills. So it's a win-win for everybody. Um, it would take about, they've told me, about six to eight weeks to get all the lights uh, replaced in town, it would occur somewhere about three months after uh, an approval from the Board of Selectmen to actually enter into this contract with them. And um, overall, uh, the, uh, for the first five years, we have to pay back Unitil for the other half of the stranded cost on the lights, the other 120000 But we don't pay them out separately. We pay, are going to pay them... Um, out through what is uh, electricity savings, because right off the bat, you start saving about $5,000 a month in electrical costs, and their buyout is uh, about 4,000 a month, which leaves us right off the bat, we'd start saving $1,000 a month. In electrical costs over the full 10 years, $1 million is what the town will save. So um, that portion of the budget will stay in check, and if anything, go and start really to go down after the fifth year. So I welcome any questions. Ms. Wolsey. This is exciting. We're going modern and we're saving money and we'll have better lighting. 
thank you, Chris, for putting in this article. Great. Is there further discussion on Article 28? Seeing none, Article 28 will appear on the ballot as I'll printed. Make, oh, I'll, I'll make a motion to reconsider, restrict reconsideration on 26, 27, and 28. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to restrict reconsideration on Articles 26, 27, and 28. All those in favor, raise your cards. Cards down. Opposed? The motion's carried. Thank you to Pat Bushway for handling those last uh, several articles. We're much appreciated. We'll move on to Article 29. As we look forward to the uh, lunchtime break, we'll go no later than 12.30. Uh, so let's see um, how many articles we can get through between now and then. Article 29, shall the Town of Hampton vote to establish a sidewalk and Americans with Disabilities Improvement Capital Reserve Fund under the provisions of RSA 35 for the purpose of estimating designing, building, building new, replacing and improving sidewalks in either concrete or asphalt, depending on location, signage and illuminated crosswalk infrastructure, including accessibility pursuant to the Americans Disabilities Act, and to raise and appropriate the sum of $100,000 to go into said capital reserve fund and appoint the Board of Selectmen as agents to expend from said fund. Further, to authorize the Board of Selectmen to apply for, accept, and expend any federal, state, or local grants and funds for the purposes of estimating, designing, building new, replacing, and improving sidewalk signage and illuminated crosswalk infrastructure, including improving accessibility pursuant to the Americans with Disabilities Act, with said grants and funds to be added to the Capital Reserve Fund created hereunder. Majority vote required, recommended by the Board of Selectmen for. 01, not recommended by the Budget Committee 080. Fiscal impact note from the Finance Department, the estimated 2019 tax impact on $100,000 is 3.0 cents per thousand dollars evaluation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 29? Moved by Mr. Bridal, is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Waddell. Uh, Mr. Jacobs, would you like to be heard on Article 29? I would, thank you. Uh, for the record, Chris Jacobs. Um, this is uh, another initiative, along with the street lighting uh, type of initiative that uh, the department's trying to embrace, trying to move forward. Um, of critical nature is that around town we are deficient um, with respect to our ADA uh, requirements, meaning accessibility to sidewalks for people with disabilities. Um, Along with that, I've noticed that there's been, in the past, a number of articles trying to move various sidewalks forward. Sidewalks in themselves, uh, from a project management perspective, uh, don't stand up very well, meaning that <clears throat> there's very few contractors that are interested in coming out and doing some sidewalk improvements for us for the twenty-five dollars or $30,000 that we currently have in the budget. I think the Budget line is actually 26,000. So the intent is to have this $100,000 capital reserve fund uh, available to the department at the discretion of the Board of Selectmen that as we tackle various streets, like for instance, we're on Ann's Lane now, is where we've gone below and we've taken care of the sewer and we've done the drainage and the paving, that the other portion that always needs to address and seems to get the short stick is the sidewalks. So this particular fund would uh, allow us to uh, access these funds to be used in conjunction with other department funds, other resources, including um, our pavement grant money, uh, to get a much better project done, a complete project done, um, do it all at the same time rather than nickel and diamond or coming back later on and digging up new pavement, which I hate to do. The other reason for this particular article was I was asked to be on the review committee for uh, each year there's grant money available through New Hampshire Department of Transportation. Um, a portion of the gas tax money is always set aside for two programs called the TAP grant program and the TIGER grant program. Uh, these are funds that the schools have even applied for and used in the past to make improvements to sidewalks around the schools. It was interesting to see the rating process and what allowed certain communities to actually get money and other communities not to 
be eligible for money is they had previously committed through th a program like this, having a capital reserve plan in place to show that they already had matching money. So if 10% match was required from the grant, they always said, nope, we've already got it, it's right here. And other communities would say, well, we'll put together a Warren article, we'll think about it. Well, when they, um, the people through DOT and Rockingham uh, planning look at these particular projects, they want to make sure that they have a really uh, good chance of getting done. And if a community has already stepped up and A has a sidewalk plan and inventory, which I do, it's right here, multiple pages, and we've rated our sidewalks, we know which ones we want to do, we know which projects are come up for it, those types of monies then become available to us. Right now, um, the way our department is set up and the way our funding is set up, we wouldn't. We'd continually rate way too low because we're, we're never ready to actually pull the trigger on a particular project. So in response to ADA concerns and in response to the community's request for sidewalks in, in trying to be available to get you grant money to offset the cost of these projects, that's the reason why we drew up and came, brought this particular warrant article forward to the board. And thankfully, you know, the board has uh, uh, selected or, or, or supported the project. I don't want people to think when it says not recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee that um, they're against sidewalks. And, and I don't think they are, and they can speak for various reasons why they, they voted for it. And I heard one person say, well, you really need 500,000. I said, yeah, but I don't want to choke the horse. Let's start with 100,000. Let's just show some commitment. Uh, it's worked with the road improvement bonding or capital reserve fund that we do 300K every year. Let's start with 100K and see where we can move. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 29? Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Fred Rice, 15 Heather Lane. Um, I think that everybody has always been aware of the fact that uh, ADA compliant sidewalks and other facilities are important. But I hope that nobody else, that as few as people as possible, uh, have to go through learning as suddenly and as, as, and as abruptly as I and my family have over the last year just how important these are. Uh, the, the transitions uh, from sidewalks uh, onto the street are things that can make an absolute, a huge difference in an individual's ability to go from place one to place two, uh, to get in and out of buildings and so forth. Um, I'm absolutely amazed that you get a zero to eight vote from any board that would tend to deprive people of accessibility within their own community. And I think that the budget committee ought to be ashamed of itself, whether they like or don't like sidewalks. They ought to be ashamed of themselves for voting against somebody, something that would give people more accessibility within their own community. Uh, so I'm very much in favor of this. I do, however, Mr. Moderator, if I may ask, I'd like to ask a question and, and if you could uh, uh, see who might uh, be able to, to uh, answer it, either the public works director or whoever else. Um, this initial amount that goes in there, uh, is there a plan in place or, uh, on how much this would accomplish during the first year? And what is the expectation of the amount of money that would be um, raised through the grant programs and other means in future years? And how much would that keep taken care of? Uh, would uh, Mr. Welch or Mr. Jacobs or Ms. Hale wish to address uh, the question about how much of the $100,000 would be used in year one if the article were approved? This is a question that uh, could have much debate um, as far as what would be done because, again, this is something that we would present to the board uh, as far as any ideas that come forward. Our goal is to look at how we can get, as Chris said, the best bang for our buck. Um, doing two ramps here, two ramps there, uh, certainly isn't making us all ADA accessible, but getting us the start. Um, we also don't want to uh, put the cart before the horse. The idea that this is a capital reserve fund should also mean that we're building it for bigger and better things and much better use of the money. Um, so to say, um, all of it will be spent in year one, I think would be foolish. Um, to say parts of it in our most desired areas, 
um, that need immediate attention, yes, some of it could be used, but with an ultimate long-term goal according to our sidewalk plan of actually uh, building these funds up so that we can get more done for a better price. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 29? Mr. Jones. You know, I looked at the uh, CIP plan for sidewalks. They sent us an Excel spreadsheet on this. And the sidewalks they have plugged in for 2019 totals up to $100,000. So if they effectuate the plan they have for 2019, there'll be zero money left in the so-called reserve fund. I'm not ashamed of the Budget Committee's vote, although some might think I should be. I'm not because we went into the details of some of the nuances of how we're doing this. I was actually an early advocate some years ago of setting up a separate fund. Because I inquired uh, to Jen at one of our budget committee meetings a couple of years ago, just how much money are we talking about to only repair our existing sidewalks? And I believe the number was like 10, 12 million dollars, something like that. Quite a lot of money. Two mil? Okay. There you go. Reconstruction, 10 to 12 million. Repair existing, 2 million is what I'm hearing, right? And so I think we ought to have some sort of plan on how to, work, how to put all of our sidewalks into a good state of repair, particularly before we start considering building new sidewalks. I also took note, and I think the Budget Committee did as well, that last year there was a a half a million dollar Mace Road sidewalk, a new sidewalk. That was a separate one article that was voted down. Yet on the CIP plan from the DPW, the Mace Road sidewalk is there, even though the voters voted it down. So the process of who gets what seems to be kind of uh, squishy, shall we say? Anyway, I think those are the main themes as to why the Budget Committee was reticent. There were also concerns about why do we need intra-year spending, that is to say, the Board of Selectmen having um, the sole agency to expend money from this fund. Typically, the town meeting uh, plays that role. I see no reason, and neither did the Budget Committee, that we had to do something intra-year to cause the Selectmen and not you, the voters, to vote on expenditures as we do other funds. So these are some of the main reasons the Budget Committee voted no way, Jose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 29? Mr. Waddell. Jim Waddell, 190 Kings Highway. I just recommend that people do their homework on this issue because there are a lot of towns where the feds have stepped in and said, your sidewalks are not compliant, do the whole town. And without choice, take out a bond and do the whole thing. So it's not, it's not only if you're redoing something that you have to make them compliant, they can come in and tell you that it must be compliant. So I just recommend that people do their homework and. Just Google sidewalks and ADA, and it would be financially more prudent to have a plan in effect that would help us if that came to be. Thank you, Mr. Rodell. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 29? Seeing none, uh, Article 29 will appear on the ballot as printed. We're going to break for lunch now. Uh, we have. Uh, you, can you be quick? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. right. I'll talk. <laughs> we, have technical, we have technical restraints, so we'll see. We'll get started on Article 30 then. Um, shall the Town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $20,000 for the purpose of conducting two household hazardous waste collection days during calendar year 2019 and to authorize the Board of Selectmen to permit the Town of Newcastle to participate in said collection days at their own expense and apply for, accept, and expend for such purpose any funds from the state of New Hampshire, the federal government, and any private source as may be available. Majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen, 5-0. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee, 8-0. Fiscal impact note from the Finance Department. The estimated 2019 tax impact on $20,000 is six-tenths of one cent per thousand dollars evaluation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 30? Moved by Mr. Griffin, seconded by Ms. Woolsey. Uh, Ms. Hale, you have the floor on Article 30. And thank you very much for allowing us to speak to this one very quickly. Uh, this is the household hazardous waste collection that we do at the transfer station every year. 
Uh, we do get funding from the state, um, small funding, but to help supplement it. This is the where you're able to come bring your cleaners and your oil paints and the things that collect in your garage or that you find uh, in the basement. Um, this is a service that we believe that is essential for making sure these um, hazardous wastes don't wind up where they shouldn't be. Uh, and this year in uh, response to um, surveys that we took at last year's events, we are adding a second date. We are looking for June and August, uh, hoping to accompany those that are coming in before summer and doing the pre-summer cleanup and those that are doing uh, after summer cleanup. Uh, so that is what this Warren article is all about. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 30? Seeing none, Article 30 will appear on the ballot as printed. We'll break I'd like for to make a motion to restrict reconsideration on 29 and 30. Uh, Mr. Bridal has moved to restrict reconsideration on Articles 29 and 30. Moved, uh, seconded by Ms. Barnes. All those in favor, raise your voter cards. Thank you. Down cards, all opposed. Articles 29 and 30 have been restricted. We'll be back here at 1 o'clock to finish uh, the remainder of the warrant. And thank you for your participation. Afternoon, we will resume the deliberative session. We are on Article 31. Shall the Town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $11,000 for the purpose of completing the construction and enclosing of the cemetery building at the High Street Cemetery, including A, strapping and insulation of the garage work area, B, sheet rocking and joint taping, C, installation of LED lighting fixtures and two electrical outlets and remounting of light switches, D, installation of 45,000 BTU LP heating system with gas piping and exhaust piping and appropriate wiring and thermostat and to authorize funding for said appropriation through the withdrawal of $11,000 from the principal in the cemetery maintenance trust fund which has a principal balance of more than $500,000 generated from the sale of cemetery burial lots. Majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen, five to zero. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee, eight to zero. The fiscal impact note from the Finance Department is that there is zero tax impact. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 31? Moved by Ms. Barnes, seconded by Mr. Bridal. Does anyone wish to be heard on Article 31? Seeing none, Article 31 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 32, shall the Town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $42,000 for the purchase of a, new, of a new New Holland tractor loader for the cemetery department and to authorize funding for said appropriation through the withdrawal of $42,000 from the principal in the cemetery maintenance trust fund, which has a principal balance of more than $500,000 generated from the sale of cemetery burial lots. 
majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0, recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 8-0. Fiscal impact note from the Finance Department, there is zero tax impact. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 32? Mr. Bridal moved, uh, seconded by Mr. Griffin. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard on Article 32? Seeing none. Article 33, uh, Article 32 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 33, shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $50,000 for the purpose of removing trees from the High Street Cemetery in order to protect grave sites, gravestones, and abutting properties and roadways, such sum to be used by the tree warden under contract for the removal of the trees and for the restoration of said cemetery caused by such removal and to authorize the tree warden in consultation with the Board of Selectmen, town manager, and the cemetery trustees to contract the work for said purposes and to authorize funding for said appropriation through the withdrawal of $50,000 from the principal in the cemetery maintenance trust fund, which has a principal balance of more than $500,000 generated from the sale of cemetery burial lots. Majority vote required, recommended by the Board of Selectmen, 5-0, recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee, 8-0. The fiscal impact note from the Finance Department, there is zero tax impact. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 33? Moved by Mr. Griffin, seconded by Ms. Barnes. Anyone wishing to be heard on Article 33? Seeing none, Article 33 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 34. Shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $124,750 for the following purposes of the Parks and Recreation Department? A, perform a needs assessment study for future parks planning, $12,000. B, replace fixed fencing at inline rink and throughout tuck field, $30,000. C, renovate, update Eaton Park building, $8,000. D, purchase playground surfacing materials for two playgrounds, $12,000. E, purchase a snowplow for recreation truck, $5,000. F, install a share structure for Five Corners Park playground, $15,000. G, replace two dugouts at Tuck Field for $15,000. H, replace cave building, tuck building doors with new lock system, $3,000. Uh, I, removal and trimming of trees, in dangerous condition in and around Tuck Field, $24,750, as determined by the Board of Selectmen, the town manager, and the director of Parks and Recreation, and to authorize the withdrawal of $124,750 from the Recreation Infrastructure Special Revenue Fund established with purpose under Article 44 of the 2007 Annual Town Meeting. Majority vote required. Recommended by. dollars for the purpose of continuing the upgrade of the town information technology systems, including software, hardware, and services for police, 
fire, public works, and other town departments, and to replace and upgrade computers and other equipment, upgrade the town office phone system and equipment to a VOIP, voice over IP system, and to purchase and upgrade the vision assessing data based software, including all necessary services and support, with said sum of $71,668 to come from the unassigned fund balance. This will be a non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 32 colon 7 Roman 6 and shall not lapse until the work is completed or by March 31st, 2021, whichever is sooner. A majority vote is required to pass Article 35. This article is recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0. The Budget <coughs> Committee voted 4-4. Four to four on Article 35. The fiscal impact note from the Finance Department is zero tax impact. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 35? Moved by Ms. Barnes, seconded by Mr. Griffin. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard on Article 35? Seeing none, Article 35 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 36 is a um, annual article relative to support for human service agencies. I will entertain a motion to waive the reading of Article 36 in its entirety due to its length. Moved by Mr. Bridal, seconded by Mr. Griffin. All those in favor of waiving the reading, uh, voter cards up, down cards, any opposed? All right, and then I will entertain a motion to open discussion on Article 36. Moved by Mr. Griffin, seconded by Ms. Barnes. Is there anyone here who would like to speak to Article 36? Seeing none, Article 36 will appear on the um, ballot as printed. Uh, Article 37, shall the Town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $50,000 to continue the process of converting stored paper documents to electronic format as authorized by Chapter 226 of the Acts of 2016 with said sum of $50,000 to come from the unassigned fund balance. This shall be a non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 32 colon 7 Roman 6 and shall not lapse until the purpose is completed or by March 31, 2021, whichever occurs sooner. Majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 8-0. The fiscal impact note from the Finance Department is a zero tax impact. Uh, is there a motion to open discussion on Article 37? Moved by Ms. Barnes. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Griffin. Anyone wishing to be heard on Article 37? S seeing none, Article 37 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 38, shall the Town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $90,000 to carry out all lawful functions allowed under federal, state, and local criminal justice forfeiture programs and to authorize the withdrawal of said sum of $90,000 from the Police Forfeiture Special Revenue Fund created for that purpose under Article 35 of the 2003 Town Meeting. Majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 8-0. Fiscal impact note from the Finance Department, zero tax impact. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 38? Moved by Mr. Griffin, seconded by Ms. Barnes. Uh, Moderator, yes. Offer a friendly amendment. Amending to uh, Article 38, I hereby move to amend Article 38 by changing the historical reference from Article 35 of the 2003 town meeting to Article 55. Uh, Mr. Waddell has made a housekeeping motion, and it's been seconded by Mr. Bridal. I think it's self-explanatory. We want to make sure our references to history are correct. All those in favor of the Waddell Amendment, raise your voter cards. Thank you. Down cards. All opposed. The amendment passes. Chief Sawyer, would you like to speak to Article 38 as amended? Yes, thank you. Uh, just for the information of the public, this is the, uh, the funds that we receive uh, as a result of our participation investigations with state, federal, local partners. Uh, and these are assets that are taken from folks that are involved in such criminal activity as drug dealing. These funds are awarded either through an administrative or judicial function for the, uh, the use of the uh, law enforcement agencies that have been involved in these investigations. Uh, if you remember, we ut utilized uh, some of this money to rebuild the uh, fitness center at the police department. So that's what we use the money for. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Sawyer. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 38? Seeing none, Article 38 will appear. A motion to restrict the considerations of Articles 35, 36, 37, and 38. Okay, so Article 38 will appear on the ballot as amended, and uh, Mr. Bridal has moved to restrict reconsideration of Articles 35 through 38, and Mr. Griffin has seconded 
uh, that motion. All those in favor of restricting reconsideration 35 through 38. Thank you. Any opposed? Those articles are restricted from further discussion at um, uh, today's meeting. Article 39, uh, shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $16,440 for the purpose of replacing the interior front doors at the town offices in order to make them ADA compliant. The doors will be replaced by sliding glass doors that are motion activated to allow unlimited access by the handicap was said sum of $16,440 to come from the unassigned fund balance. The exterior front doors have already been replaced in this manner. This will be a non-lapsing appropriation per R for RSA 32 colon 7 Roman 6 and shall not lapse until the work is completed or by March 31, 2020, whichever is sooner majority vote required, recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0, recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 8-0, the fiscal impact note from the Finance Department, there is zero tax impact. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 39? Moved by Ms. Barnes, seconded by Mr. Griffin. Does anyone wish to be heard on Article 39? Seeing none, Article 39 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 40, shall the Town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $10,000 for the purpose of creating and supporting the Town of Hampton Naval Committee Fund with said sum of $10,000 to come from the unassigned fund balance. This will be a non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 32 colon 7 Roman 6 and shall not lapse until the work of the committee is completed or by March 31, 2024, whichever is sooner, majority vote required, recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0, not recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 2-5-1, fiscal impact note, finance department, zero tax impact. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 40? Moved by Mr. Bridal, seconded by Ms. Barnes. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard on Article 40? Mr. Edgar. Uh, Mike Edgar, 7 Ann's Terrace. Yes, I do support this article, and I hope the, the whole town does. Um, I have been involved in some of the more recent uh, committees that are associated with uh, supporting uh, these uh, Navy vessels that are uh, most notably, of course, the USS uh, Hampton, uh, which most recently was, uh, was in, uh, in our area, and now it's back in its home port in San Diego. But, uh, I would hope that the town would support this. This is a, a long range. Uh, as you can see, the article goes out to uh, 2024, and uh, there was a decision made by some members of the town to uh, try to support some of these other vessels that are uh, other subs. Um, and right now, as, as many of you know, uh, we're working with uh, USS Virginia. So I would uh, hope people that would, uh, would support this. It's, Sometimes not fair to ask uh, individual uh, businesses to continually uh, put in money, and, and hopefully we would uh, be able to get reduced tickets available, uh, be able to pay partially for some of the activities that we would like to help support with the individuals. Plus, also, uh, we, uh, we, we do actually uh, do activities with with the, with the different crews, uh, some of which, uh, you know, benefit the town. That's not why we're doing it, but it just works out that way. Uh, let them uh, work on some of our playgrounds like they have in the past, and they're getting ready to help us quite a bit. In fact, there was about 35 or 40 of them that was going to help us with King's Kingdom, and then it was, uh, we were prevented from doing that from the weather. So, um, I, like I said, I hope people will uh, consider this and support the, uh, the crews of these uh, various ships that were the boats that we're associated with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edgar. Anyone else wish to be heard? Mr. Warburton. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, I am against this article, uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, for many years, I was proud, and I know former selectmen, my colleague Selectman Rice, and many others were members of the USS Hampton Committee and beyond, which was the precursor to this. Um, I've heard comments uh, by the, uh, the support of this article in, in public meetings that, you know, they had to pay some of their own money and the, uh, the hours that the, the people volunteer. I think we're going down a very rough road if we start asking the taxpayers for money. I pers personally paid for my trip to Norfolk, Virginia. 
a lot of us in town that worked on the USS Hampton Committee worked with beach businesses, town businesses, and we sold coffee cups. We sold uh, pins, which many of us still have. We sold T-shirts. Um, even back when the late Arthur Moody went down for the christening in 1991 to USS Hampton, which was named after four Hampton communities, uh, there is no one that, that can uh, say the involvement more than myself and a few others because I'm so proud to have known four USS Hampton commanders and I got to know and I still keep in touch. But I think when we're asking taxpayers, because the reason is, well, we need to, we, we entertain or we take them out or we need funds that is not something the taxpayers should be paying for. Um, it's a great experience. We had cookouts here. Sheila Franker, who was here, was spearheaded uh, one of the major cookouts in 1996 at Tuck Field. Um, and we had people back then. We had uh, David Lang, Steve Henderson, and others who got rallied all the employees together. They raised money. They contributed. And the only other thing I want to mention, and Mr. Boudreaux is aware of this, about six months ago beyond, a man by the name of Al Flurry who owns four businesses, pays a lot of taxes in this town, brought 15 of his people up to the five corners to build that playground. So he put in a lot of volunteers hours himself, just like all of you do, members of the board sitting here now. Rusty, I know, for instance, does a lot of community service volunteer work. I think we gotta continue on that, but to ask the taxpayers for $10,000 for another committee, when in fact it has worked fine, uh, and I certainly appreciate Representative Edgar's work most recently with USS Hampton, but I think we're going down a very slippery slope by asking the taxpayers to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warburton. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Fred Rice, 15 Heather Lane. Um, I have to agree with Mr. Warburton. Um, the beauty of having a volunteer committee that helps, that would help our, uh, the crews that come in here on the USS Hampton and other ships the beauty of having a volunteer committee is that it is a volunteer committee and that we work as a community. When you start going after the taxpayers for things that are nice to have and you start adding ships on, uh, it's the, the Hampton and then it's the Virginia and then it's probably a couple others that may come in and you hit the taxpayers up for that. Now, nobody says you have to go to Norfolk. I never went to Norfolk. I went to some stuff here. Uh, I've helped on... Uh, uh, there were like a half a dozen of us. Uh, uh, Mike Edgar uh, and I were both there when we uh, helped work on uh, uh, one of the playgrounds over near the Tuck Museum. Uh, and there were a few uh, crew members uh, came in, I believe. But we did that on a volunteer basis. And I did it because it was, you can either give time or you can give money. If I don't have a lot of money, then I'll give my time. And I did that. And I've done that for a lot of things like that. Uh, I think that volunteer efforts should stay as volunteer efforts. $10,000 is a lot of money. Uh, it's a lot of money in a small town. And I haven't heard anything said yet about what this would be used for. If it's to be used for travel so people can go to Norfolk for other things, well, let Norfolk do that. Let Hampton do the things that are here for Hampton. We're supposed to be a host committee, a uh, host town. Um, does Portsmouth do as much as we do? I don't think so. I don't think any of the other towns around here do. And, uh, but I just would hope that if we're going to spend, if we're gonna spend $10,000 to send somebody there, get a business to support it. Yes, get the business to support it. Guys like Al Fleury and others in town, Desi, they do so much in the way of volunteer stuff for the military, and I think that's very appropriate. But to say to the taxpayers, you must pay this because we'd like to take a trip or something like that, I think that's going a little bit beyond. I'd rather see it remain as a volunteer effort. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 40? Mr. Jones. $10,000, such a terrible amount of money in a $28 million budget, huh? But there are some important principles here, uh, some of which are um, the, as Mr. Rice pointed out, there's no specificity as to how this money is to be spent, if it's to be spending it for any reason whatsoever, it appears. And my other problem with it is they're using the unassigned fund balance, which you may think of as surplus on a simple level, but the technical name is unassigned fund balance, right? 
But we've heard throughout the year how important it is to preserve the unassigned fund balance because we do need to have a healthy unassigned fund balance for cash flow purposes. Um, we shouldn't be using uh, the unassigned fund balance for this kind of optional activity. I wonder, Mr. Moderator, is it possible to amend this article to uh, remove the reference to the unassigned fund balance? If you did that, you're changing the source of the uh, revenue, which I believe is is um, acceptable. So if you want to propose that amendment, um, you'll have to put it in writing, and then I need to get a second. So I think what you're saying is... You well, probably put a period after Naval Committee fund, and you correct. would delete with said sum com to come from the unassigned fund balance. Right. right. The comma after the fund would be a period and no words after that, up to the next period. Right, okay. So, um, before I write it up, can I get a second on removing the reference to the unassigned fund balance? So anybody who seconds Mr. Jones's amendment? Well, I guess not. I don't see it. So, uh, the other problems that are, that are existing with this is, as I said, there's no specificity as to how the funds will be spent. We're gonna hold this money for five years until it's spent, if necessary. Don't know why we need that long a period of time for a lousy ten thousand dollars, but whatever. And by the way, it just keeps coming up to me the Naval Committee Fund, which implies that we're going to be welcoming the Navy. Apparently, any Navy, including the Russian Navy. Vote no. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 40? Yeah. Ms. Bridal. First of all, as a member of the previous Hampton Committee that was just uh, last year. I don't believe anybody was paid to go on any trips. Matter of fact, I think the chairman went out to uh, San Diego on his own dime for that. So to, to think that we're sending people on trips or, or doing it, that's kind of a false or misleading statement. Second of all, we have been asked by the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard if we could help them out and be a host city for more than just the USS Hampton. Now, when the USS Hampton was here, we did a lot of that. We worked with them. We did have fundraising. I've done money of it as well as many others here, including Mr. Warburton. However, they've asked us now, and I think this is under, uh, more or less, you could put it under patriotic service. I think that the, the, the town should feel honored that the Navy Yard has asked us to help them. And I think we should, we should support this. I think it's a, a good thing, and it's $10,000. And to keep it on for a number of years, maybe, that, maybe that's because, one, that ship's going to be here for two or three or four years. And second of all, that does not preclude any other funds from being raised to do stuff. And I know we have a lot of businesses in this town that donate, and donate well to the, these type of funds. But you want to know something? If we need a little seed money for here or there, it's a good thing for this. It's a good thing for our community. It's a good thing to help support our servicemen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bridal. Anyone else wishing to be heard? When you get done with the okay. Yeah. Seeing none, Article 40 will appear on the ballot as printed. Uh, we didn't get a second. So before we go to Article 41, I'm going to welcome our um, Hampton Academy students uh, and thank everyone uh, who has supported their efforts. They're going to Washington, D.C. Uh, later in the year, which is exciting. I believe it's the first time that Hampton Academy has gone to Washington, D.C., um, or at least the first time in, uh, in recent, um, recent history. So you have results of the raffle? Yep. Okay. Would you like to read those results yeah. off? So I'm Avnish, and this is Alex. And so for the first raffle, which is for the giant chocolate basket that you saw, uh, Jed Carpenter, or Jeffrey. Carpentier. Jeffrey. Carpentier. Yeah. Is he here? He was here earlier. OK. I don't um, that's his name, so we have his number. For the jewelry, we have Barbara. Is she here? Barbara, you won the jewelry. Great. Barbara now. <laughs> And then um, for the 50-50 raffle, you won $67. Congratulations, Griffin, if you're here. 
So thank you to our Hampton Academy students for spending um, their Saturday with us and uh, providing the food. And I know there'll be other opportunities um, to support them in their efforts to uh, make sure that all their classmates who want to attend can go to the trip in Washington. And thank you for your, your support today. Article 41, shall the town of Hampton vote to repeal sections 167-47, 167-47A, and section 167-47B, permissible unfounded emergency calls, section 167-48, service charge, sections 542-3, service charge for unfounded emergency calls, and section 542-4, permissible unfounded emergency calls, New Hampshire statutes provide that false alarms, regardless of cause, are violations of law that are handled by the police and the courts not by town ordinances, making it necessary to repeal these provisions. Majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 41? Moved by Mr. Bridal, seconded by Ms. Barnes. Is there any discussion on Article 41? Seeing none, Article 41 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 42, shall the town of Hampton vote to amend Chapter 149-16, police attendance, to strike from the end of the paragraph the words plus 30% and substitute the words plus 50% or, or such rate as is voted by the Board of Selectmen under RSA 41 colon 9A, majority vote required, recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee, seven to one. Fiscal impact note from the Finance Department, zero tax impact. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 42? Moved by Mr. Griffin, seconded by Ms. Barnes. Chief Sawyer, would you like to be heard on Article 42? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, this article for folks um, is more of a housekeeping issue. You recall last year the board voted to raise our administrative fees for police de details from 30% to 50%. The reason for that was the cost for the town to cover the retirement costs for officers working had gone up when the state started uh, voiding themselves of that responsibility and giving it back to the municipality. So that increase was necessary. Uh, one of the issues that we didn't catch though was under the uh, entertainment ordinance that had been locked in at 30 percent. And I would ask folks to support this simply because the board needs this ability to make that vote in real time to keep up with the ever-changing costs. When the insurance costs change or the retirement costs change, the board needs that flexibility so the town is not taking a loss when a police officer works at an entertainment venue or on a, a road job. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Sawyer. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 42? Seeing none, Article 42 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 43. Strict reconsideration on 39, 40, 41, and 42. Mr. Bridal has moved to restrict reconsideration on articles 39 through 42, seconded by Mr. Griffin. All those in favor, please raise your voter cards. Thank you. Down cards, all opposed. Articles 39 through 42 are restricted from further discussion at today's meeting. Article 43, shall the town of Hampton vote to distribute to the general fund all remaining funds that are left in Fund 21 that was created through Article 41 of the 1996 annual town meeting for the improvement of town-owned infrastructure located in the Hampton Beach precinct from 20% of the parking fees collected from town parking lots by the town under such authority by the town under such authority was rescinded by Article 44 of the 2007 annual town meeting and then to close such account, the remaining fund total, $41,616.19 plus any additional interest earned thereon, majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0, not recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 062. Fiscal impact note, finance department, zero tax impact. Motion to open discussion on Article 43 from Mr. Bridal, seconded by Mr. 
Griffin. And I have a friendly amendment. Okay. The, the amendment is I hereby move to amend Article 43 by changing the historical reference from the Article 44 of the 2007 annual town meeting to Article 45. Okay. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Waddell. So housekeeping to make sure our historical reference is correct. I don't think that requires any discussion. All those in favor of uh, correcting that historical reference. Thank you. Down cards. All opposed. So Article 43 is amended to reflect a historical reference to Article 45. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard on Article 43 as amended? Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Fred Rice, 15 Heather Lane. Um, I remember when all of this went down with this, this funding. Uh, initially, this was a great idea. We would take part of the, the, the parking revenues uh, that were generated, 99% or 90% of them, by tourists who come here in order to invest it in the infrastructure at Hampton Beach to repair the, the wear and tear that had been created by those same tourists. And it was a great idea. It was a way that w it would enable us to uh, have some funds to do this without having to tax Hampton uh, taxpayers uh, any more to do it. Uh, then in 2007, there was a very well-intentioned uh, but badly, badly worded uh, warrant article that stopped that fund. And uh, Charlie Preston wanted to get the, the tennis courts uh, uh, repaired up here by Tuck Field. And the warrant article that came out, the way it was worded, it sounded like we we're going to take the funds for a year and we we're going to use them to repair the tennis courts. As it turned out, the actual wording closed this account and froze the money that was left in there. So there's stranded funds in there. We could never do it again. We, we could have opened up a new fund, but we didn't. It's unfortunate that we didn't because I think the idea of taking a portion of those parking revenues to up for the upkeep of infrastructure at the beach was a great idea. It was part of the whole project to rebuild and repave Ashworth <laughs> Avenue and the lettered streets. There's lighting there that still is not completed and so on and so forth. So what we have is money that was intended to go for maintenance, infrastructure maintenance at the beach, that now we want to take and put into the general fund for general, un, not necessarily specifically authorized spending purposes as the Board of Selectmen or the manager may, may choose. Uh, I don't like that idea. I think that we ought to put <coughs> back into the same thing that it was originally intended for, and that is repair of the infrastructure at the beach. That's the purpose and the understanding under which that money was collected, and it should still be used for that purpose. There's two ways to do this. One is, would be to amend this warrant article with a lot of convoluted language again. You know, after this thing was, this fund was closed, everybody agreed that that was probably the worst worded warrant article we have ever had in the history of the town of Hampton. It was confusing. Most people wish they could have pulled the vote back, but they weren't because it was already done. Uh, but, and so we could go through that same drill again. Or, we could say no to this warrant article and come up with a new, better, properly worded article in conjunction that passes the review of town council, the budget committee, everybody else, and the beach commission, uh, the, the beach uh, precinct, because they, those are the ones who, who kind of oversaw all of this. I would prefer to do the latter. So the bottom line on this is I would recommend not voting for this article and that we go back to the drawing board and come up with a newer, more sensible article to spend this money where it was originally intended by the taxpayers of the town of Hampton on infrastructure at the beach, but do it on a more organized and better thought out manner. So I would urge you to not vote for this article, to vote no on this article. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 43? Seeing none, Article 43 will appear on the ballot as amended with our housekeeping amendment. Article 44, shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $110,000, $55,000 from taxation, and $55,000 from the conservation fund 
for the fee simple purchase and permanent protection of plus or minus 70 acres, a 70 acre parcel, plus or minus, map 63, lot one, located off of Timber Swamp Road in Hampton for the purpose of conserving open space, protecting wildlife and aquatic habitat, and preserving wetland and flood control areas in the best interest of the town for the appraisal value of $108,000 plus $2,000 for legal and closing costs, of which the overall sum may be reduced if land conservation grant funding can be secured. Said premises to be held in perpetuity by the town of Hampton and placed under the care of the Conservation Commission. This parcel shares a common boundary line with both the Herd Farm, 120 acres, and Bachelor Farm, 110 acres, conservation easements, and will be the first parcel to connect these two easements, creating greater protection for the Taylor River watershed. This funding will be non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 32 7 Roman 6, and will not lapse until the acquisition of the land or by December 31, 2021, whichever is sooner, majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen, four to one. Recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee, eight zero. Fiscal impact note, the estimated 2019 tax impact on $55,000 is 1.6 cents per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 44? Moved by Ms. Wolsey, seconded by Ms. Barnes. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard on Article 44? Mr. Diener. Thank you, Mr. Mondelegas. I'm Jay Diener of the Conservation Commission, 206 Woodland Road in Hampton. Um, this parcel uh, is, is unique in that, as the warrant article says, it connects some existing uh, conservation easements to further expand our protection of the Taylor River and Old River watershed. Um, it's important for water quality. It's important for flood storage. It's important for um, wildlife habitat uh, um, and passageways. Um, we have, as part of the Conservation Commission, a conservation fund that was established quite a number of years ago. And the purpose for that fund primarily is to purchase conservation easements or parcels when it's in the best interest of the town to preserve those parcels. And we believe this is one of those parcels. The conservation fund has been used recently um, in 2018 to purchase additional, prop additional acreage in the Hampton Town Forest. Um, and because of the funds that exist in, the monies that exist in the conservation fund, there was no additional cost to the taxpayers for those acquisitions. However, we don't have enough money in the conservation fund to pay for this entire parcel. So we're asking, we're offering to put up $55,000 from the conservation fund and asking the taxpayers to cover the cost of the additional $55,000 so that we can complete this purchase for the benefit of the town and its residents. So I urge your support for this warrant article. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Or anyone else wishing to be heard? Ms. Geyser. Ann Kaiser, 7 Palmer Street. I just have a couple of questions for Jay. I'm wondering if this land is currently in current use. I believe so. And what would be the impact of the land use change tax once the town owns this land? I don't know. Okay. I don't think there should be any, Ann, because the, land, the current use designation applies to acreage 10 acres and more, and yes. this is going to go from, what, 70 acres to 70 acres. So I, I don't think there should be any land use change tax penalty as it shifts from, um, I guess, a private landowner to the town if this were approved. So. Okay. Just wondered, just wondered about that question. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Mr. Lessard. Yeah, Keith Lessard, 173 Mill Road. I rise in support of preserving the wildlife corridor out on the western part of town. If you were to look at it on a map, you'll see how it connects all the way through from the Northampton. Our goal, I guess, is to go from Northampton to Hampton Falls. Um, Jay does point out some great features of preserving this land and water quality and wildlife areas, and also areas maybe that we can still hunt in Hampton. Um, passive recreation and open land. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lissard. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 44? 
Ms. Wolsey. Uh, excellent article, excellent protection for the town. This will bring together several contiguous parcels over there, protection for the wildlife. You won't see houses on stilts in there, and it's protection for the river. Outstanding job by conservation, and I strongly urge you to join me in supporting this article. Thank you, Ms. Wolsey. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 44? Seeing none, Article 44 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 45 uh, is a lengthy article relating to uh, the proposed establishment of a Heritage Commission. Due to the length of uh, this Article 45, I would entertain a motion to waive reading it in its entirety. Moved by Mr. Bridal, seconded by Ms. Barnes. All those in favor of dispensing with the reading? Thank you. Any opposed? All right. And now I would look for a motion to open discussion on Article 45. Moved by Ms. Barnes. Do I have a second? Seconded by Ms. Woolsey. Uh, is there anyone who wishes to be heard on Article 45, which relates to establishing a Heritage Commission? Yes. Jason. Okay. Thank you Bashan, very much. our town planner. Yep. Thank you very much, Jason Bashan, town planner. Um, this uh, article is prepared in response, or it follows the 2015 town meeting um, Article 35 vote, which passed abolishing the then existing Heritage Commission. Um, since that time, the town has seen development projects that have, have had an effect on older buildings and site features. Uh, this has resulted in a renewed interest in efforts to encourage the preservation of buildings and places of historical interest, architectural significance, and community value. Um, this was a topic the planning board had discussed over a number of its meetings back in 2018, and ultimately th this article was proposed. Just to touch upon a couple of uh, points from the article, um, it tracks the RSAs um, on heritage commissions, uh, specifically 674-44B, for the purpose of outlining the advisory and review authority of the heritage commission, which you can see up on, on the screen there. Um, the article also specifies the manner in which regular and alternate members are to be appointed, in addition to cite, uh, stating the need for the commission to elect a chairman, a vice chairman, and ultimately establish its own rules of procedure after it is formed. So just a little background on that one. Um, the vote on that was 6-1 from the planning board, um, but that's the background on that article, so thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 45? Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Fred Rice, 15 Heather Lane. Um, I served on the previous Heritage Commission during its entire life from the time it was formed in about 1998, I believe it was, until it was disbanded a couple of years ago. The reason it was disbanded was because it was basically a non-functional uh, body. Uh, we could reestablish it, but it would be like bringing Lazarus back from the dead. It was virtually impossible to get anybody to serve on this board. And the reason was because it has no real function. There's nobody in this town that loves the history of this town and the preservation of its old buildings any more than I do. I grew up when most of these buildings in town weren't even here, and I want to preserve the old ones. But a heritage commission has absolutely no function in being able to do this. And I challenge anybody to prove me wrong on that. It has no teeth. It has no authority to do any of these things. The only way you can prevent, you can preserve the old portions of town uh, is to have the building inspector refuse to approve a demolition permit. We tried several years ago to come up with a historic district ordinance. And I want to tell you, that got more resistance than you can believe. Nobody wants to have someone else tell them whether they can paint their house, what color it is, whether they can add shutters or not, whether they can change any of the trim, change anything about that structure, renovate it or anything else. That's what a historic district uh, would do. There are only so many places you could put a historic district in town. One is in the center of downtown, and most of that has already gone well beyond that to the point where, what are you, what are you gonna, are you gonna redo the, the 401 Tavern so that it's like the way it was 100 years ago? It's not at all the same building that I remember when I was a kid, but it's beyond 
being able to preserve it. The other area of town is around the ring, Winnicott Road, Park Avenue, and the residents around there do a great job of maintaining their properties, and they resist like crazy anybody telling them what they can or cannot do. As far as the other um, functions in here, um, I've, I've got to go down these, Mr. Moderator, because they are, they are specific to, to why this is not a good idea. Surveying and inventorying of all cultural resources. The Hampton Historical Society does that in spades already. We tried to do it when, uh, on the Heritage Commission, found there was no, we couldn't add anything to what the Historical Society already had. To conduct research and publish findings and so forth about the historic uh, district and its ordinances, we couldn't do any of that and, anywhere and even hold a candle to what the Hampton Historical Society was doing. C, assist the planning board as requested in the development review of items. Yes, we did. We worked with the planning board. We had a rubber stamp for demolition permits. And there was, we made sure that they took pictures and recorded what the building looked like. Beyond that, we had no authority to stop them from destroying a building if they chose to do so. There's one very famous one in town here um, that used to be um, the, the uh, Newicks. When it got torn down, it was done without any demolition permit whatsoever. A large building that was taken down a piece at a time and was never given a demolition permit. Advise the local agencies uh, on matters affecting cultural and historic resources. Nobody in town can do that. A brand new five member board can't do that. The Historical Society can. Publicizing it activities. They put out a newsletter, they, they're online and everything else. They already do these things. Receive gifts of money and property. Sorry, that ain't gonna happen. We tried that for 15 years to get authority from the town to receive money and property and weren't able to get it. We weren't able to own any property. Our only cultural property, and it, the, it came down to the grist mill, the blacksmith shop, the fish houses, the cooperage. That's it. There are no other things for a, a Heritage Commission to take charge of. They just aren't there. And we had no role whatsoever in it. We had to, it took an act of Congress practically to be able to get access to the fish houses so we could see what they looked like to see what shape they were in. We couldn't go near the grist mill. Is a new group gonna have that authority magically out of somewhere when we couldn't before? Uh, there's a thing about acquiring property. We had no budget, we never had a budget. The only way we, the only thing we ended up doing on the Heritage Commission was the placards for old houses built circa 1810 or whatever. And, it, and the people in the houses had to buy them themselves. There was no public money for that. So other than uh, the, the, the uh, wild belief that we can establish a historic commission when it was soundly defeated before, there's no value in that. I want to keep these buildings, but this is not the way to do it. I would recommend very, very strongly that we not try to uh, amend this, uh, adopt this this year. I think that we should take a year and look at what of these functions can be performed to the same degree that this calls for in here by the historic, uh, Hampton Historical Society. They are a nonprofit, we can't disturb that, but we can discuss with them what they can provide in the way of information and resources to help preserve old buildings in the town. We can certainly do that. And I think that it would be worth taking the time to sit down, look at the problem, rather than just trying to, I mean, we got rid of the old Heritage Commission for a reason. It did not work. The Board of Selectmen representative, the Planning Board representative, the two of them never came. They had them on there before. They never came to the meetings. We got down to three or four people that were there. We had some alternates that would come in as often as the regular members. But it was a totally non-functional deal and there's nothing that's gonna magically give it powers that it doesn't have. There is no ability other than a historic di district that has been shot down before that could possibly save old houses in the town. There are other methods that are far more effective. I urge you not to vote for this.
I urge you to vote against it. Uh, by the way, I have spoken to a couple of the members of the planning board, and they agree in concept. They wanted to make sure, you're not going to amend this, are you? No, I don't want to amend it. I want to kill it. I want to kill it. I want to do it the right way next year. And I would gladly be a part of any discussions that would help educate the people that think a Heritage Commission is a good idea as to why it had such a difficult time in this town this, over the last 15 years. That's not just a day or two of experience. That's 15 years when it didn't work. Don't try to resurrect the dead. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Ms. Carnaby. Ann Carnaby, Tide Mill Road. Clearly, we need all the help we can get to preserve our history in this town. We need Heritage Commission, we need historic districts, we need the Historical Society. We have more history in this town than most, and we're losing it fairly rapidly to neglect, um, demolition, whatever. And I, I truly believe that, you know, if at first a Heritage Commission doesn't succeed, then we should perhaps try, try again. And let's pass this and let's have another group of people. There's, there's a lot of empowerment in the RSAs for the Heritage Commission. Let's see what we can do this time around. Thank you, Ms. Carnaby. Uh, Mr. Lessard. Um, I would agree with Ann. There's a lot of history in our community. Um, what, 1638? Um, yeah, the Historical Commission was voted out. I believe it was the Board of Selectmen eliminated it, and there was a problem with people, um, volunteers. Of course, there's a vo problem with volunteers and everything. If we were just looking in the audience at the 30 people here. Um, hopefully everybody's watching us at home while they're vacuuming or something. Um, I say that lightly. I know people look at it and take it seriously, but um, maybe we miss what's gone. Maybe we, we need the Heritage Commission because we realize some of the powers it had. Um, the, concert, the Hampton Historical Site does a wonderful job, but they really don't have all the powers that the RSA grants Historical Commission. Um, I rise in support of this, and it's not taking anybody's land rights away. It's not taking their buildings. It's not raising money to buy them and restore them. But it is forcing documentation. Um, we just had a, a case before the planning board, which a lot of folks are upset with, on Winnicunnet Road, where an antique um, Cape Cod will be um, removed or demoed. And um, there was a lot of folks that thought maybe it could be preserved or relocated to a, along Winnicunnet Road so it looked like it belonged there and would be preserved. But there was very little teeth or any other rules that, um, or anything just to pump the brakes of the developers so they could take a second breath and look at what impact they are going to have the community and allow the community to talk about a loss that we may suffer. Because once it's gone, it's not coming back. So. I hope that's not the case with the Heritage Commission. I hope that it's gone, but now that we bring it back, please vote yes and support the, historic, uh, the Heritage Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lissard. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Ms. Wilsey? Yes, I agree with Keith and Anne. And this town goes back to 1638. There's a beautiful old home, about 1790 vintage, uh, on Winnicunnet Road that's in danger of being demolished or removed by developers. Let's keep what little heritage we have left. Some of these structures are very, uh, very valuable to this community. And I certainly support and will vote for this article. Thank you, Ms. Wolsey. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Seeing none, Article 45 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article. Your motion to restrict, restrict reconsideration of 43, 44, and 45, please. 
Uh, moved and seconded by, moved by Mr. Bridal, seconded by Ms. Barnes to restrict reconsideration of articles 43, 44, and 45. All those in favor, raise your voter cards. Thank you. Uh, all those opposed? I declare the motion has passed. Those three articles will not be uh, available for further discussion at today's meeting. Article 46, on the petition of Kristen Russell and at least 25 Hampton registered voters, shall the town of Hampton raise and appropriate $3,000 to pay Experience Hampton, Inc., the organizer of the 2010 to 2018 Hampton Christmas Parades to help defray the expense of the 2019 Christmas Parade and related activities, majority vote required. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen 5-0, recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 8-0. Fiscal impact note from the Finance Department, the estimated 2019 tax impact on $3,000 is one-tenth of one cent per thousand dollars of valuation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 46 moved by Mr. Bridal? Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. Barnes. Is anyone here to be, uh, who wishes to be heard on Article 46? Seeing none, Article 46 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 47, on petition of G. Berkeley Bennett and at least 25 Hampton registered voters shall the town raise and appropriate $6,500 to reimburse the Hampton American Legion Post 35 for the purchase of 200 bronze service flag holder grave markers. American Legion Post 35 would place the markers to properly honor the graves of our veterans in the High Street Cemetery, which are currently missing service flag holder grave markers. Recommended by the Board of Selectmen 401, not recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee 071. Fiscal impact note, Finance Department, the estimated 2019 tax impact on $6,500 is, um, what is it? It's two tenths of one cent per thousand dollar evaluation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 47? Moved by Mr. Bridal, seconded by Mr. Griffin. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard on Article 47? Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Berkeley Bennett, uh, 12 Wayside Farm Lane, Hampton. I'm also the commander of American Legion Post 35 uh, in, in concert with uh, Boy Scout Troop 177 at Hampton. We decorate the veterans' graves for Memorial Day. Uh, when we do that, we utilize uh, a bronze flag holder, a, a emblem that's on a rod to support the flag. Uh, it's become evident uh, through several surveys over the past couple of years that many of the graves are missing these flag holders, and the purpose of this Warren article is to replace those flag holders. In fact, we have over 100 World War II veterans who are missing or do not have a uh, flag holder. Uh, I do ask uh, everybody to rise in support of this petition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Mr. Warburton. Yeah, I <clears throat> just want to make a statement. The reason the vote of the Budget Committee was 071 was simple. We all felt that the money should come from the Cemetery Burial Trust Fund. So there were comments made that, oh, we're not for the military, we're not for the deceased, and we, we all agree with what Mr. Bennett and the Legion are doing, but we, the mechanism that's being used, we don't agree with. We think it should come out of the Cemetery Burial Trust Fund. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warburton. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 47? Mr. Bridal. Yes, uh, that's all well and good, but it can't be done if they don't have some funds now, and right now the funds are coming out of the way it is. So I would encourage the voters to vote for that. So. Thank you, Mr. Bridal. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 47? Seeing none, Article 47 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 48. On the petition of Megan Riley and 25 or more registered voters, shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $520,000 for construction of a sidewalk on Mace Road within the town's right of way for the safety of our residents? Background. Project reviewed by appropriate parties, an estimate includes necessary elements required for construction, tree removal, et cetera. Majority vote required, not recommended by the Board of Selectmen, 041, not recommended by the Municipal Budget Committee, 062. The fiscal impact note from the Finance Department, the estimated 2019 tax impact on $520,000 is 15.5 cents per thousand dollars evaluation. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 48? 
Moved by Mr. Bridal. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Wardell. Um, would you like to speak to Article 48? Yes, I would. Please state your name and your address for the record. I'm Megan Riley, and I'm on 14 Toby Street. Uh, so I submitted this article again from last year. We had an amazing response for this article uh, with 42% of voters uh, in support of construction in, in just its first year. And I'd like to see this approved this year. There were a lot of questions um, and discussions on feasibility. A lot of focus was on that last year. And as I put in this article, the project was evaluated. It can be done and it's within the town's right of way. Um, the sidewalk connects two major roads with existing sidewalks near the school, providing a much safer option for students and pedestrians. I see runners, I've seen dog walkers, I've seen people walking, and I've seen people on motorized wheelchairs going down the street on a daily basis. You see cars swerving sometimes, but not always, and you see a lot of people driving really fast and not paying attention. Um, I'll tell you as someone who runs on the road, walks on the road, I do it with and without my children, it can be absolutely terrifying. It is so dangerous. I've almost gotten hit multiple times, and I know um, the, the people that live nearby me, my friends and their families are also um, uncomfortable going down the street. So I, I know when I drive my kids to school, I see other children walking on the street with huge bags. They've got you know, musical instruments, and I, I, I just, I can't, it, it's very hard to watch just seeing how um, distracted drivers are today. So I think it's, it, it's very clear that sidewalks are important to this town. And it's encouraging to see that there's an article to fund future projects. And there's certainly been discussions of a plan, uh, but we're not there yet. Um, and it's about our community and keeping us safe and evolving as a town. So I hope the community will support this article and keep the momentum going for future sidewalks in a safer Hampton. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Riley. Ms. Riley, just, I have a question for you. Uh, could you give us sort of the start and the finish of where this sidewalk would go? Yep, so the, the, the area that we evaluated would be from Mill Road um, down to High Street, so where Five Corners is with okay. the, um, the playground right there. Okay. So right. they have sidewalks connecting at both ends. Great. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 48? Hey there. Hi. Is this okay? Yeah. yeah. My name is Abby Marceau, and I'm at 14 Philbrook Terrace in Hampton. And I'm in support of Article 48. Um, let me tell you a quick story. In 1987, I entered kindergarten at Hampton, in Hampton um, over at Marston School with a little boy named Dan. And you guys probably remember this story. Um, Dan, during the course of our kindergarten year, um, was told that his sister was killed um, while she was exercising um, on High Street in Hampton, um, which triggered the uh, sidewalks that are there today. <clears throat> uh, obviously, um, it, it, it's very dangerous on, on Mace Road. Um, it was dangerous on High Street at the time. Um, so we really are just asking that you guys understand that it's not just kids and families using the sidewalk, it's everybody. Um, we should be encouraging people to get outside to walk and walk our streets. Um, we live in a safe town and um, we're fortunate for that, but we definitely need to step it up with uh, the sidewalk. So thanks so much. Thank you, Ms. Marceau. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Jen McIsaac. I live on 6 Janet Lane. This is my son, Matthew, for anybody here last year. I brought him as well. Um, I'm really hopeful that the sidewalk will get passed before he's able to uh, be in school himself. Um, just a couple things I wanted to highlight. I think I've seen that there's money in the capital improvement plan, but I see that it's not in there until 2023. Again, I think it's a dangerous road. I'm not willing to gamble or to bet for five years, and who knows what changes between now and then to see if that money even sticks. And then I would also say, if anybody's ever walked on the road, I very much agree with Megan that it's extremely dangerous, and I am incredibly um, anxious as you walk in two specific places along that road. One is as you turn the corner right by Ridgeview Terrace and where a little river dumps in. It's a hill, there's a corner. There's almost little chance that you see anybody coming at you or anybody sees you as a side uh, or as a pedestrian on the street. And that exact same scenario is um, what I see happening on Mace where Toby Street comes in. So I think there's probably other streets within the town that could use sidewalks as well, but I view Mace as just incredibly dangerous, how narrow it is. Again, it's a big cut through from going to Route 1 to be able to get onto High Street and skip some of the lights. Um, and it's really busy all year long. It's not just in the summer. I see cars flying back and forth 
in the middle of the winter, in the middle of the day. Um, and again, as a mother of three small kids, I think it's, I don't, I guess I would say it's not inexpensive, but I think it's absolutely worth the investment to keep people safe. Again, whether you have small children, you're out there walking your dog, you're taking a walk yourself, you're running, et cetera. So I'd really like to see Article 48 passed. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Barnes. Uh, Regina Barnes, for, uh, 95 Presidential Circle. Uh, I want to let the public know that I was the abstention at both the uh, selectmen and the budget committee level on this Warren article, and the reason for that was because I didn't know what to do. Um, I respect our Public Works Department. They have a five-year, six-year sidewalk plan that makes sense, but at the same time, this is the second year. These same group of people have shown an interest and care very deeply about having a sidewalk on their road. If you drive down Mace Road, we have a great playground down the end of it that is scary for parents to get to. You know, they end up driving there when they could be walking or they could be riding their bicycle. I don't walk as much through the town as I used to, but I do ride my bicycle, and it's very scary. So when you have small children, it's even scarier. Cars go a lot faster now than they did 5, 10, 15 years ago. They don't pay attention. They're looking at their phone. I ride a motorcycle. I know this stuff. People don't pay attention when they're driving. It's something we have to learn to deal with. So while I respect town management and I respect our public works department, this is the second year these people have taken the time to petition this Warren article. So rather than just going over it and saying it's half a million dollars and it's not in the plan, I think maybe we need to either, if you're going to vote no, I understand, but at the same time, we really need to, like, this is one of the things that we really need to take into consideration. There's a lot of places in this town that need work that just are not getting it. And there's a lot of people here right now that usually are not here. And I'm very happy to see people that are younger and are getting involved, and this is something that's involving them. So. I just want you to consider that when you're in the ballot box on March 12th. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Anyone else? Ms. Wolsey? Over there. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, if I'm reading this correctly, or what the discussion has been about, ladies, the uh, you're talking about taking down trees, and the only trees are on the sort of southwest side. Not, not the ones by the playground, but across from the play playground is where you'd put the sidewalk. Well, let me warn you, because sometimes things have unintended consequences. If you should get the money to have a sidewalk built along there, you're going to destroy some of your property values. You realize that, taking down all those trees. And the house at the bottom, the southernmost house, which is the farthest east house, will have the sidewalk right at their front doorstep. And people are going to stand, if you put your house up for sale, and people will stand there and say, my God, I don't want that little bitty lot. It's just a little crammed in lot. So that could potentially seriously affect the value of your homes when you are, uh, when and if you decide to put them up for sale. But I am absolutely opposed to sidewalk by petition. So I think in fairness, uh, Ms. Woolsey, Article 48 talks about placing the sidewalk within the town's right of way. So it, it is town property. It wouldn't be impacting anyone's private property rights. This work is proposed to be done in the town's right of way. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 48? Yes, sir. Uh, John Riley, 14 Toby Street. Um, I, I understand everyone's concerned with the money. Um, obviously, it is a lot of money, but is there a price for safety that you can put on people? Um, like we said, it, it, with the outturn from the vote last year, it seemed like there was definitely a lot of interest from the town. Um, I've done a lot of research, and I've seen that sidewalks help um, improve pro property value. Um, I'm not sure if taking away trees would decrease property value. I don't know. I, I know I have seen uh, figures where sidewalks do help out um, the, the, the price of people's, uh, you know, lots and everything because it does make the community knitter tighter and I just, that's what I've seen. So I'm not sure about taking away trees if that would take away from someone's property value or not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. A quick follow-up. You don't see when you drive down the street or walk down the street 
where the town's right of way is. There, there are little signs or little lines saying, here's the town right of way. But there is a right of way there, could be 10 feet or more. And if you strip that, because the town right of way is now, it now has trees and other structures in it. If you strip that down, it's going to make those lots look and actually be smaller. And it could, it could seriously impact the value of your properties. But they won't be any smaller. They'll be the same size. There might be the perception that somebody's front yard is wider than it is That's because, right. but DPW could come down around town and take down a tree in the town's right of way if it deemed it necessary. So I don't think it's fair to put that on the petitioner. Um, the proposal is to do work within the town right away. So my point was simply it's not adversely impacting any personal property right. So anyone else? Ms. Riley, do you want to have another word? So again, this is a, a similar discussion to last year. Um, this has been evaluated, and you are correct that it, that that land is within the right of way. So people want to be in Hampton. I know a lot of people that would really love to live in the town. They want to come and raise their children here. And I would be really surprised if people um, would, would, would look poorly on having a sidewalk on a, a very busy street. And I'm not sure when the, the last time was that you walked on the street or have driven down that street. But you, I, I think you said that you lived just around the corner, and I think you re recognize that it is a very busy street. So to try to place that you know, might bring house values down, I mean, Hampton's, you said it yourself, is continuing to develop, and, and you know, people obviously want to be here. So we want, our, we want our residents to be safe. I want my children to be safe, and I don't want to hear about anyone else in Hampton getting, getting hurt because of a, a sidewalk and someone not wanting a tree down. So right. I just hope you consider that. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Riley. Um, seeing no one else on 40, Article 48, Article 48 will appear on the ballot as printed. Should Article motion to restrict reconsideration on 46, 47, and 48. Moved by Mr. Bridal, seconded by Ms. Woolsey to restrict reconsideration on Articles 46, 47, and 48. All those in favor, raise your voter cards. Thank you. Down cards. Any opposed? Those Articles 46, 47, 48 are restricted from further uh, consideration at today's meeting. Article 49 is a lengthy article. I would entertain a motion to waive the reading of Article 49 in its entirety due to its length. A move by Ms. Barnes to have a second on that. Can I get a second? Seconded by Mr. Griffin. Uh, and I will now take a motion to open discussion on Article 49. Getting a motion. Anyone want to Moved by Mr. Griffin. Can I get a second on uh, discussing Article 49? Seconded by Ms. Barnes. Is there anyone here who would like to speak to Article 49? Which Article 49, just in a um, uh, quick overview, is a proposal to establish an ordinance um, that pertains to smoking in certain areas of town. Uh, if you could introduce yourself, sir, and state your address for the town clerk. Hi, Anthony Caro, 7 Keen Lane. Thank you. I'm here to support um, this article, Article 49. It's something that we um, got voted in last year, but um, somehow it didn't get turned into an ordinance, and we're hoping to see this fully through this time. All right. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 49? Ms. Wolsey? Congratulations, it's a great article. I'm glad to see that you included the electronic devices, which may not leave cigarette butts on the sand, but certainly would affect the quality of the air. So I congratulate you, and I think this is an excellent article. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 49? Mr. Jones. Is this a binding one, Article Mark? I can't hear you. Is it binding? Is it binding? Yeah. Is what you said? Um, Mr. Gerald, have you had occasion <coughs> or are you able to offer any opinion on whether if Article 49 were passed, whether it would be binding and enforceable? Um, I do think insofar as it uh, relates to the care, protection, preservation of use of public cemeteries, parks, commons, libraries, and other public institutions, and insofar as it uh, regulates the kindling of fires 
uh, or for removal of all combustible materials from any building or place as the safety of property in the town may require. Um, I do think it is, uh, it is one that's within the authority of the townspeople to adopt as a bylaw. Thank so, you. So I guess the answer is yes, it is binding if it's voted up. The town can vote it. Yeah. Okay. And as I also understand my, my reading of this, that uh, smoking on any town-owned property would be prohibited, correct? It uh, relates to public property, yes. So it's just town properties, not state property. It doesn't affect state beaches, for example, right? Well, the, the, the state tells us that they're sovereign on their beach, so I guess that uh, it won't apply to them. Right. And it does apply to people smoking in their car when they're driving on town roads, correct? Um, I Since they're on uh, town property. I hadn't considered that. This is a petitioned article. I think you'd want to ask the petitioners whether or not they intended to be governing that. Right. Well, the intent I'm not too concerned with, although I would be interested in hearing their intent on that point. The question is one of legality. As the way I read it is if you're on town property, whether driving in your car or riding your bicycle or whatever, you cannot uh, um, combust, so to speak, right? <laughs> Spontaneously or otherwise. <laughs> and it doesn't, not, it doesn't appear to pro prohibit vaporizing, from what I can see. It talks about combustible material only, which, of course, vaporizing is not combustible. So uh, I wanted to get clarity on that as well. It seems to be overly broad. We're going to have people coming. We have a lot of visitors coming in this town. And if we start enforcing this ordinance, which I'm sure our chief of police will enforce any ordinance we pass, we're going to have to do it uh, unilaterally. I'm not going to say, you're a visitor, you can smoke in your car. You, you're not a visitor, you can't smoke in your car kind of thing. So a lot of people are going to get surprised to get pulled over smoking in their car. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Anyone else wishing to be heard on yeah. Article 49? Mr. McFarland. Thanks. Uh, Mark McFarland, 3 Warner Lane. Uh, I'll be brief and try not to be a comedian up here. Um, I don't expect the police to enforce this like I wouldn't expect the police to enforce uh, picking up dog poops. Um, but what this does, and let's not nitpick whether I can drive down uh, the street smoking in my car. This gives us who <clears throat> are offended, um, feel our health is at risk, the ability to approach somebody in one of our public places, whether it's at a kid's park or at a sporting event, and ask somebody to remove themselves when they're smoking. Um, that's the expectation. Let's not nitpicky and try to be funny about this, and uh, <clears throat> let's just support it. It's common sense. Thank you, Ms. McFarland. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Seeing none, Article 49 will appear on the ballot as printed. Article 50, we, the undersigned registered voters of Hampton, New Hampshire, in order to protect the human health, preserve the natural environment, conserve precious and dwindling natural resources, and to curb the desecration of the beauty of the town of Hampton and the state of New Hampshire, and to protect the health, welfare, and safety of its citizens, request you to insert into the warrant for the 2019 town meeting the following article to see if the town will vote in favor of the following to establish a no smoking ordinance stating that it is unlawful to smoke in any public park, cemetery, common beach, or other public property of the town of Hampton, New Hampshire. Persons in violation of the provisions of the ordinance bylaws will be subject to a fine. Is there a motion to open discussion on Article 50? Moved by Ms. Barnes. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Waddell. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard on Article 50? Mr. Carroll. Uh, Anthony Carroll again, 17 Lane. I'm here to uh, ask if you could um, amend Article 50 as to not confuse the voters and add in Section 1 through 7, which is on Article 49, which would make this article like binding. No, I mean, the concern I have with both efforts here are, is, are we introducing a new purpose 
um, into this article, and I, I think we are, Mr. Caro. So I always like to make things as clear as possible, but you, you've got Article 50 um, requesting that an ordinance be uh, created to, to establish. And this, I gather, is your ordinance. Right. Right. So I think I'm going to decline, not I think, I'm going to decline your proposed amendment. Uh, we don't introduce no, new subject matter on, it's, the, it's, on, the, on the rationale that um, if I knew something like this was going to be proposed, I would show up. And if I didn't know about it, I didn't show up. So that's why we don't take new subject matter. So I appreciate the fact that uh, Article 49 um, has all these and Article 50 doesn't. Um, but that's where I think we should leave it. All right. Thank you. Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Fred Rice, 15 Heather Lane. I don't smoke. I don't like smoking. I hate it. I tell people who are near me who are smoking when I don't like it that I don't like it. I ask them to stop. But this, both Articles 49 and 50, they go a little bit too far. Public land, picture this. Public land, middle of January, there's a storm. The wind is blowing at about 40 miles an hour. And somebody's sitting down on the, the bench on the edge of the ocean, and they light up a cigarette. Are you going to tell me that that's going to affect somebody's health that's standing 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet away? Absolutely not. And what police officer in this town is going to use the judgment to say, wow, he's endangering the, that other citizen's uh, health over there. I better go stop him because there's a fine attached to this thing. We're going to fine him $50 for lighting up a cigarette in a 40-mile-an-hour wind. Not practical at all. I mean, I hate smoking. Let me tell you, I would love it if nobody in the world ever smoked. I would be very, very happy with that. I used to smoke many years ago, April 14th, 1984, but who is keeping track of when they quit? <laughs> I am. And this is just an absolutely non-enforceable uh, ordinance. And if you're going to have something on the books that is not enforceable, then it doesn't belong on the books. If you're going to have it on there, it better be enforceable. Otherwise, you're shooting yourself in the foot. So I know the intention of this is very well-meaning and everything else, but I think there are other ways of educating people and that we should promote those and push those as hard as we can and not enact unenforceable ordinances. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Mr. Carl? Yes, I'd like to add something. Um, this is our second attempt to put this through. And I really like to believe that Hampton is a forward-thinking town. Let's not be the last town in the United States to pass this. There are plenty of other towns that have already had this ordinance already through. It's, it's, a, it's a surprise that we don't. So let's, uh, let's lead the way. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carl. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 50? Seeing none. Article 50 will appear on the ballot as printed. That brings us to the end of our warrant. We will reconvene um, here uh, in the dining hall on March 12th, Tuesday, March 12th at 7 a.m. Voting, uh, the polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. to act on the 50 articles that you've just um, reviewed and discussed and in certain instances um, amended. Thank you very much for participating today. Uh, and uh, uh, hope to see all of you uh, on Tuesday, March 12th, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. at um, the Winnicott High School Dining Hall. Thank you. Motion we, to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Seconded by Mr. Waddell. We are adjourned at 2.27 p.m. Thank you.